What's going on, everybody? And welcome to the Tri-State Guilty Gear Invitational. We have invited four players from the New England area to come out here and compete in some Guilty Gear Strive for your viewing pleasure. I am Brad Muse. Joining me is my good friend, Matt Hogan. Monkey Business, how are you doing today, sir? Wonderful. So happy to be invited to commentate the Tri-State Guilty Gear Invitational. All of you in our audiences, however skilled, experienced, or familiar with fighting games you may be, you are invited to learn about Guilty Gear Strive, fighting games, and all of our four unique character representatives, mm -hmm. the characters themselves, their abilities. We'll be taking you through it. We've got promotional videos, tutorial content, our very own wisdom, <laughs> and of course, live matches from all four of our players in our double elimination four-player bracket. An ambitious ambitious idea, for sure. The uh, But, you know, we... Uh, we can pad this out by making it as educational as possible, right? Yeah, which speaking of, we do know that some of the people who are watching are perhaps newer to, if not fighting games in general and the concept of this style of tournament, then uh, definitely newer to the Guilty Gear series or Guilty Gear Strive in particular. And we actually came prepared for that. We have a little bit of informational content to help get you guys started coming up right now. In Guilty Gear Strive, two players choose from one of 20 characters to take into a duel against their opponent. Each character uses a slew of attacks, jumps and dashes, and throws to empty an opponent's life bar. Every character has a selection of normal attacks, special moves, and overdrive. Sickle shield! Normal attacks are the typical attacks in a fight and are inputted using a button and directional combination. Every attack does damage, but also leaves the recipient stunned for a brief period. During this time, an attack can use another attack to chain these moves together into a combo, dealing damage on each successful hit. Special moves require a series of direction inputs using a joystick or D-pad. Special moves can vary in style, from fast lunging attacks projectile attacks, or command grabs. We'll get to grabs in a moment. Special moves can be used to cancel the ending of normal attacks. This means a combo can add a special move into the mix. Finally, overdrives are moves that use more complex directional inputs and require the user to expand tension out of their meter at the bottom of the screen. These moves can cancel out of specials, enabling high damage High complexity combos. To avoid getting hit, a player can block incoming attacks by holding back. Blocking is the primary way to avoid damage, although there is a catch. Some moves can only be blocked high or low. Characters that are crouched will block low attacks but are vulnerable to overhead attacks. Blocking while standing will stop an overhead attack but makes the character vulnerable to loads. If a player is becoming too overwhelmed, they may burst to force their opponent back. This consumes their burst gauge, where they cannot use it again until it fills back up. To break a player's guard, a character can throw their opponent by inputting the throw command while close to them. This move takes the opponent out of their blocking state and throws them in either direction. A player can prevent an opponent's throw by starting a throw while their opponent begins their own. Doing this is called teching, and pushes the two characters away from each other. Throws are slower to start up than some normal attacks. If your opponent is initiating a throw, a quick normal attack can counter an incoming grab. And with all that, you should be up to date to enjoy Guilty Gear's drive. If you have any questions, tweet them with the hashtag AskTriggy. Stay tuned and enjoy the show. Yep. And just like he said, make sure if you have any questions for us through the course of the evening, you can tweet with hashtag AskTriggy. You can see it there on the bottom third of the screen. That is the best way to send questions to us. Any questions that you guys send out, we're going to make sure get answered for you. The whole point of this is that we want to get more people excited about competitive Guilty Gear Strive. It is a great time to be a fan of competitive fighting games right now. Great netcode. Uh, proper tournament circuits are coming back. There is plenty to be excited about, just like I'm excited about this bracket that we're going to be getting into in just a second. Four players up here. You see them up on the screen. Nero and Silver Fox in one match. And the first match that we're going to be giving you today, Alex Smith versus Sammy. 
Yes, that's right. And it's a character locked exhibition throughout the whole way through. And we happen to know that Alex Smith is a May player we're both quite familiar with. Yeah. And Sammy on the Potemkin. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited to see that matchup play out. Both very up close, scrape heavy, brawler heavy characters. Uh, very different in the way that they approach that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Potemkin obviously a very conventional grappler in so much as you can be a conventional grappler in this title. Yep, by being uh, slow, by being uh, feeling heavier to maneuver, but being more handsomely rewarded for being at point blank range than anyone else in the cast for the threat of that command grab. The namesake Potemkin Buster, every Potemkin player's waiting or possibly not waiting to find the right time to use it. That can be a bit of a patience test of oneself. Yeah, yeah. but we were uh, patient enough here. We do have Alex about to step into the studio for the first match, the May player on display here. And we have a brief intro here to introduce you guys to Alex Smith. My name is Alex Smith. I'm from Amherst, Massachusetts, and I play May. I first heard about Guilty Gear from my close friend, Bonch, he told me it would be perfect for me because it had an anime style, metal music, and metal references, and it's this really cool fighting game. Fighting games have been in my life since the arcades of the 90s, like Dream Machine at the Holyoke Mall, and on the home systems like Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. I'd like to thank my friends and family, especially my mother, for her amazing support. Uh, thank you, Mom. Truly. Uh, I have to shout out my Discord homies and JPV. Thank you for always holding it down. And I play in a melodic death and doom metal band called Vacant Eyes. And I have to thank my bandmates, of course. I love you guys. Thank you so much for everything you do. And uh, thanks to everyone I've played in fighting games over the years. Especially everyone who went out of their way to help me learn and to grow both as a player and a person. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Uh, please take care and please stay safe. And that was Alex Smith, the May player. And, and you alluded to it just before the video started. You and I both have known Alex Smith for quite a while. Uh, when I started playing fighting games back in like 2009, 2010, Alex had already established himself in the community up in uh, New England. And there was a period of time where any major you turned on any given weekend, you saw Alex at these events. Yeah, yeah. Certainly the most experienced competitor we have, I think. And uh, I mean, New England being the region he's from, my scene way back out in uh, Buffalo, New York was even familiar to him just because mm -hmm. he traveled so widely. And I think for as long as we've known him to be a traveling player, he's had the all black tournament outfit with the May t-shirt on yeah. deck. <laughs> Trademark Alex Smith hat. We actually got a rare photo of him in that intro without his hat. I was going to say, I've sincerely never seen him without his hat. I, yeah. <laughs> I was, I, you, none of you had the, the pleasure of seeing it. I was actually shook in my chair. Yeah. I have known him for over 10 years. I have never seen him without his hat. That was like Evo 2015 when Sonic Fox took off oh, their yeah. furry hat and suddenly like the real brain was exposed right. and hair and everything. Yeah, I, I wasn't ready for it. <laughs> now, do you think if any of our players challenge Alex enough, the hat could come off? Maybe. Uh, I would love for that piece of lore to happen here. If anyone yeah. might, our first next player coming in might be the one to do it. We have a introduction here to their opponent, Sammy, coming at you right now. I'm Sammy. I live in Western Connecticut. I play Potemkin. I dabble in Faust. And I'm very excited to play Testament. I chose Potemkin because he's big. I, I wanted to main Faust when I started because I've always enjoyed the aesthetic of Faust. But I've, I've felt a real connection with Potemkin. Something about how he plays, his Potemkin buster, it just all feels so good. In 2001, playing Soul, that Soul Calibur 1 cabinet, this little, little 10, 11 year old kid, whenever teenagers would show up, I'd be like, hey, I bet you $5 I can beat you. And they took the bait every time, and I would beat them almost every time. <laughs> Just all the people I've been playing Guilty Gear with, and Skullgirls, and hopefully more fighting games in the future. Um, just shout outs to them. I love Strive. It's it's one of my favorite fighting games. 
And there is Alex Smith's opponent, Sammy, going to be representing the Potemkin. Oh, yeah, the Devil yes. Horns on the screen. That's how you know it's a Guilty Gear tournament. I was about to say, yeah, Heaven or Hell, Let's Rock is uh, clearly represented in that one gesture. And, uh, you know, I saw the incredibly decorated room from yeah. Sammy there. All the Pokemon all in there. Going to catch them all, obviously has done in the past, but will Alex Smith be catching all of these hands, the massive hands of Sammy's Potemkin, who's logging in right now, skipping a PS5 agreement, actually agreeing to it. We are uh, allowed to play Guilty Gear. And uh, Connecticut from Sammy against Alex Smith. I think the sole Massachusetts representative. Yeah, I do believe that's right. Silver yes. Fox uh, has roots down in CT, and I know Nero also has roots down here. So uh, the uh, lone invader... Uh, yes. Coming in with uh, you and I, obviously representing uh, Buffalo and Massachusetts, respectively. And yeah. yeah, I mean, there was there was a lot of multi-game representation there in Sammy's room as well. We have the there's the Final Fantasy 14 OC in the back. I want to mm. know who that signed poster was. I know we have hashtag Ask Trigi. You can hashtag Tell Brad who is uh, in that poster that was signed. There was a wonderful like 70s looking afro in it. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna have to probably ask Sammy about that, and then Sammy can tell Brad. And yeah. that's, that's where the hashtag tell Brad will come from. And, uh, you know, the cool thing is we won't have to ask them anything about their play. We're going to bear witness to every second of it right here. I personally won't be blinking for the entire duration of this. The first set of the evening, you got to get all warmed up, right? So no more blinking, uh, heavy breathing the whole way, hyperventilating, all, all the things we have to do to commentate properly. Oh, they skip the intros because they're so ready. Oh, that's what you know. That's what you know. Immediate jump back from Sammy. Doesn't want to deal with the round start position against May. Zemkin not with the fastest button, so you definitely want to do it. Ooh, great whiff punish on the up dolphin. Already representing a little bit of matchup familiarity here is yep. Sammy. Yep, and that was the close slash into 2H Gatling. A uh, nice close button from Potemkin. You saw it used as an anti-air from Sammy. Great instincts. It uh, goes up nice and wide. Be on the lookout for basically any time Potemkin is close. That close slash punch versus Potemkin Buster is a constant mix-up threat. Oh, 2S makes contact. Same with a nice delayed combo, but Alex Smith burst out successfully. That defensive mechanic right there, burst meter. You can see both of them used it, eager to take round one. Doing a lot of damage here, but possibly, yeah, definitely going to mm. kill. Yeah, that was a real shame. Sammy had uh, played a lot of that round really well. I think it just really came down to that unfortunate throw situation that Alex got. Counter hit on the Dolphin. We don't get a big follow up off of it. Oh, the big meaty, but the late jump cancel already back at the corner, having to mash out with those two piece here is Sammy. But slowly working forward, 56p though, does Alex yep. just start to deal with this mega fist that Sammy has been representing so well. So. Yeah, classic air approach tool from Potemkin. Both these characters, no strangers to throwing themselves at you with their whole body. Uh, and you know, similarly to Totsugeki, the dolphin that May is riding off of all of her buttons on those cancels there, Megafist also has a very generous hitbox. Oh, yeah. So often I think this matchup will be decided by who can anti-air slash anti-dolphin more efficiently throughout the matchup. Full charge, oh from Alex Smith taking to the skies. Oh! The first whips way up there. Alex Smith kind of just... Didn't even get a chance to combo, but Sammy with no burst is surely in trouble here. So I don't know that Alex chose not to combo, right? Because especially that early on the full charge dust, as we're just barely able to close this Ooh. out, the dolphin. I don't know if that's a juggle or if it just killed on That was chip. an OTG. Oh, it was an OTG oh, dolphin. Yeah. So what I was going to say about the full charge dust is you always have that mind game around whether they're going to burst in the dust combo. Mm -hmm. Alex clearly didn't commit after the dust. So I have to imagine he just was willing to let Sammy burn the burst. And that's huge. You're up around. Sammy yep. does not have that crucial defensive resource here. And Sammy hasn't been representing YRC as a defensive choice either. Garuda yeah. comes out. Yeah, I, you know, Potemkin players, they really like to keep the Red Roman cancel around for comboing off of Mega Fist. Combo miss. There's your Mega Fist combo without any meter spent because it's a counter hit. Be on the lookout for attacks interrupting the startup of other... <laughs> oh! Heat Knuckle out of the air. That is the anti-air grab. Puts May in prime position to get Potemkin Buster, the Potemkin namesake. Sammy is undefeated on Pop Buster so far. No whiffs, only success. 100%. Spe speaking of whiffs, though, Alex whiffing that throw. But as we say in the FGC, you are plus on whiff. Gets away with it. Sammy not punishing it. Slowly inching forward here is Alex. But Sammy's still doing a really Ooh. good job of sniping these Mega Fists through. And a gold burst from Alex. But the armor goes through the charge on the slash there. Oh! Looking for a pot buster, I assume, was that 6P from Sammy, but Alex Smith's invincible choice of super gets him out of the situation, no problem. Sam is in trouble. They are have burst to possibly make a comeback here. Could see a gold burst, counter hit combo. Unfortunately committed to butt drop, so burst on block. Not really much to gain there from Sammy. 6P clash, recovers in time. 
great combo choice moving forward. PRC almost picks up a combo so close to Sammy to sealing this round. Oh, I was so ready for a Garuda after that. So was Alex. You oh. saw him going on the FD and the double jump falling works out for Alex. Sammy's so close and you're seeing the adaptation. Still doing a great job of sneaking in those Mega Fists. And you called out the anti airs of the Dolphin. Yep. Look how often Sammy is going to 6 Oh! Neutral. Ooh! Kara Pop Buster at round start. That's a clean 50%. Yeah, that's round start Kara Pop Buster. And for those unfamiliar, Kara is the act of canceling the startup of one thing into another to give it more range. Gave, gave that Pop Buster round start reach. Great 6P interrupt. I think Sammy might have been waiting for a burst, but 6P can combo into Heat Knuckle. Pop's anti air grab where he shoots you while holding onto you. Here's an example of a great juggle combo. Good knockdown. Sammy contending with the corner now in a tough defensive spot without burst. Going to die off this command throw. May's classic overhead kiss. Yeah. Does not hit overhead. You cannot block it. It is simply a command grab. And honestly, we've seen more overhead kisses successfully here than Potemkin Busters, making May look like something of a grappler, maybe more of a grappler so far. Yeah, I mean, she needs it for her game plan, right? Her, like we said at the beginning, they have a similar sort of game plan. I think... May's game plan lends more towards the strike element, but she still needs that command grab threat to reopen the strike game. Speaking of strike, catches him on the dome with the fall after the RC. Gonna be a juggle in the corner. Sammy has burst. Reversal super. Pushing back to mid-screen. Both of them have burst. Sammy needs to burn it immediately, and he does. This is still a one-touch game for Sammy if he finds the right hit, but smoked by the overhead on Wake Up. Alex is actually gonna close it out with a clean sweep 3-0. You love to see a mix-up tool like an overhead 6K being used only once and only when it mm -hmm. ends the set successfully. So uh, that puts Alex into winner's finals. Sammy, still with their tournament life, uh, will be contending against whoever win. I mean, loses our next match, such as the nature of the double elimination bracket. Yeah, so for any of you who are not familiar in the double elim bracket, the fact that Sammy lost does not mean they are out of the tournament. When we cut back to the bracket overlay, you'll see there's a lower section. Uh, you do have to lose two sets in order to be eliminated from the tournament. Uh, so whoever wins and makes it to the end in the grand finals on the winner side actually gets the opportunity to lose two sets against the same opponent, which may well come up later today. We'll have to see how our grand finals pans out. But that always leads to a, a really high moment where you have this close grand final set and the person that came from the loser side has won and it's not over. That Now you just have to weather that storm and do it all over again. It's a real uh, endurance test to make that loser side run. But I think Sammy played that really well, and I definitely believe that uh, they have it in them to make that trek out there. There was a lot at play there. I think maybe if I had to levy anything, I kind of wish we saw a little bit more Garuda. I do know... A impact, though. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, I do know that uh, some of you, again, as we said, uh, we know that some of you are looking to Guilty Gear Strive for the first time today. We do have a little bit of information specifically about Potemkin so that you guys can understand a little bit more about what you saw coming at you right now. <laughs> pop Buster, you know. Sometimes they go for Pop Buster and 6P comes out. The the video will come out though. Yep, the 6P, the Pop Buster, we do have more info for you yeah. for Potemkin right now. Potemkin is a slow and heavy grappler who can withstand massive damage while delivering even more to his foes. Potemkin, unlike the rest of the cast, cannot air dash nor run. Instead, Potemkin advances using a variety of special moves with built-in dashes and hops. Closing space is vital to Potemkin as his signature attack, Potemkin Buster, is a command grab that deals massive damage to his opponent. Potemkin crushes his opponents with large normals, strong grabs, and powerful defensive mobility. His presence and power fit players looking to overpower their opponents and keep them frightened, no matter who has the advantage. So plenty of information there about Potemkin. We will see more of him because as we were just explaining, Sammy is down in the loser's portion of the bracket. We'll end up playing against the loser of our next match in Nero versus Silver Fox. The winner of that moves on to play against Alex Smith in the winner's finals. We do have uh, the bracket there to show you there. Yep, so as you can see, Alex Smith has advanced forward. Silver Fox versus Nero is going to be our next match. Leo versus Andre. Yeah, so people have been wanting to see more Anji since about the beginning of the game's life. He hasn't been as popular of a pick. Uh, some people may may say that that is because he, he is weak, but 
anybody that's playing the character has to be believing in his strengths. I think if you play the character with that kind of self-defeating mindset, you'll uh, find yourself practically like purposely pitfalling in that way. And Nero, a confident player, um, Nero, Nero is the Andy player, correct? Correct. Yes. So no, no doubt we'll uh, be bringing their A game here. And uh, against Lielo, a defensive fortress, who is perhaps the scariest character to defend against. We got more information coming up for you about that character real quick. It's going to be Nero introducing themselves as a player first, though. And there they are, Nero, going to be coming in, playing on the player one side. Yeah, that Anji. And, and you were talking about, you know, that self-defeating mindset. I can think of a couple of local players that have continued to push through with Anji, have uh, have made some local memes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we know all of I suppose not local to you now, because you're back over in Buffalo. Um, but yeah, I mean, they've, they've given him... They've given him some stuff. The the early cancel off of Fujin is is interesting. I don't necessarily know that it solves his fundamental problem. And I feel like everyone that I talk to about Anji comes to the same conclusion, which is just that Fujin and its follow-ups uh, don't demand enough respect. And the first thing that I think of when it comes to that is Silver Fox's character, Leo, because I remember at launch, everyone had the video of every post-Fujin option getting beaten by Leo's uppercut mm -hmm. on block. Yeah, so context. Fujin is like one of two character-defining specials. It has three follow-ups that inherit a lot of risk and don't necessarily... I mean, there can be big payoff on the riskiest of them all. Yeah. And a, a sharp contrast to Leo, who practically off of any successful hit, including from an invincible reversal, can start their win condition plan. And uh, our Leo representative... It's coming up real quick. We'll be seeing them on player two side, Silver Fox. Let's hear from them. Hi, everyone. I'm Silver Fox. I'm from the Northeast, and I play Leo. I always play aggressive characters. I love being really aggressive. I love putting people in situations that allow them to be uncomfortable so they make mistakes, and then I exploit them. Uh, in short, I grew up playing in the arcade, and um, I got my start there, you know. Um, grandma would drop me off with like a couple bucks, and you know, I had to learn to get good to make those 50 cents uh, per game last. Uh, I won a kind of a good tournament um, against my mentor, who came in second and I came in first, but he was amazing, and I just happened to get lucky, and I was really fortunate enough that he taught me pretty much uh, almost everything I know about fighting games, so thank you so much, Tom. I can't wait for us all to play. There he is, Silver Fox coming in on the P2 side. Uh, another more experienced player. I, I, uh, I only got to meet him through the course of, of doing uh, Tri State Guilty Gear Invitational here, and uh, I did not realize how deep his FGC roots went. He was talking to me about going to arcades back in like the CVS2. Uh, in the Marvel two days, CVS meaning Capcom versus SNK two. So these yeah. are these are very these are older but very foundational fighting games to the the long standing culture of the fighting game community and what the tournament landscape looks like. So very deep roots, very fundamentally practiced. Because obviously these different games, the skill sets don't translate one to one from one game to another. But there are certain universal fundamental skills that you develop as a fighting game player over your time playing in this genre that mm -hmm. definitely translate over. And that's something that Nero here is going to have to overcome, yeah. definitely being the more junior competitor in this matchup. And the players you learned in that arcade era learned by trial by fire. Oh my God. They, they couldn't have a training mode or online
find resources to help them. Oh, I you mean, put your quarter on the machine. When your quarter came up, you played, and if you lost, that was it. Back of the line. Yeah, so no line here. Uh, j just a bracket, double a limb, and we'll see which one of these people is sending the other to the loser's bracket. Full intro is rocking this time. Maybe I shouldn't even be interrupting these dramatic characters. Just kidding. I already did. It's too late. Not too late to watch the match, though. Here we go. Already a leg up here for Nero. Oh, wow. Actually, I was going to talk about the fact that Anji theme is playing against the vastly superior Leo theme. Huh. But had that backdash close slash at round start, but we are stuck in the corner. Nice up back, but the back turn stance counter, getting Silver Fox back in the momentum. Nice backdash to blow up the grab attempt from Silver Fox. Nero, though, been facing the right corner this whole round, basically, and a very late heroic burst, a term we use in Guilty Gear to describe when somebody uses their burst, a mechanic tied to coming back over the course of the round, kind of the opposite Ooh. of those tension meters you see at the bottom. With a lot of belief in oneself, though, a hero burst can possibly pay off with a huge comeback, but instead Nero is entering this next round with no burst available. Burst a very useful resource against a character like Leo, who can very quickly rush you down and scare you uh, repeatedly with forced mix-ups and uh, oppressive knockdown situations, one of which is starting right now, yeah, facing the left corner this time. Yeah, I was about to say that's exactly what you're seeing, and that's really the nature of Leo's offensive structure, right? He can play really safe. He has this great ability to stagger a lot of his limbs together and make you have respect a lot of pressure, exactly like that. Mm -hmm. The micro dash into the 6K right into the throw to close it out off the tick grab for this first game. But the way that he can mix you up on the left, right, uh, with the cross up, uh, what we what we colloquially call the Berserker slash, named for Wolverine's move in Marvel Three. Yes. Um, but he also has the high lows with the low short on the back turn or the overhead, some of which all lead to different combo options. And now you're stuck in the Ooh. corner. A gold burst attempt from Nero, unfortunately, does not work out. And the guard point doesn't work as Silver Fox spaces it really well, finding the overhead. But unfortunately, the combo is dropped for Nero. The gold burst on Silver Fox also with right into the overhead. That is the second raw overhead starter Nero has landed raw and has overhead. unfortunately not converted into any damage. Yeah, it's a very valuable starter for a full combo and unfortunately the name of the game, the smell of the game as Guilty Gear Strive players would say is that landing your combos off of any possible hits is the key to efficiently winning the round and ending your opponent's life bar. It's making multiple hits out of an opportunity where there could possibly only be one and the more variety of combos you land the stronger you are of a player uh, demonstrating your character's abilities. Oh, wow. We just used 2D as a, a poke attempt there. Berserker Slash right at the very tip of 6 8 Ooh. success. It does not work out. Once again, these overhead starters. Silver Fox not blocking the dome, but it's not really doing a whole lot for them because Nero is not capitalizing off of these. I think you're supposed to link 5K for that. Is Absolutely. That the usual yep. It's 5K into Fujin, and then you can get the low or the hop. In Nero's case, another heroic gold burst attempt, even though Nero had a lot of meter already, has a chance to use it, was about to go for another overhead, and Silver Fox struck out previously taking three overheads to the dome, but on this fourth one, the lesson was learned. A quick 2P interrupt, that Silver Fox demonstrating those fundamental strengths. Knowing when their turn is available to be taken, regardless of how forceful their opponent is trying to be with mix-ups, that often uh, aren't scientifically allowed. You know, the frame data said no, and Silver Fox figured that out. Yeah, and that's the whole strength of stagger strings, right? Is like the respect for the follow-up options is what affords you the opportunity to cheat better options for you after the fact. Finding the throw, you can tell that Silver Fox was definitely fishing for the throw there. The overhead gets blocked. Silver Fox, now in game three, has become wise to it. Another overhead start from Nero. I kind of wish Nero would go for the low. We've not seen the DP represented from Silver mm -hmm. Fox, which as we talked about is something that, I mean, now that Anji can empty cancel Fusion, it's it's more of a guess that you have to represent it. Mm, wire Seer is a defensive option. Great choice, especially now that Silver Fox could possibly be cornered, but that overhead is punishable on block. Double digits negative, and Silver Fox knew that and uh, has figured it out. Found a great combo on the punish, too, taking a, uh, an opportunity and making the most of it. Yeah, I really wish, especially now that Silver Fox is very clearly waiting to block the overhead, I think Nero should use this opportunity to stagger off of Fujin and cycle back in. There we see the low Ooh. option and baits the DP. This could be really huge damage. Let's see we the use combo. the red RC. That's going to get us all the way over the corner. No, unfortunately, we drop it using the neutral jump to try and use it as a spacing tool against the superior ground game of Leo. The mm. whiff on the throw. What a shame. Yeah, so throws are a great tool for mixing up your opponent, but in Guilty Gear, as you get up off the ground, you have this thing called throw protection, 
which prevents you from immediately having to deal with such a devastating mix-up between strike and throw as soon as you wake up. So it makes waking up and blocking off the ground oh, very valuable. That's this is not an invincible super. Way. It's not invincible. There you go. Nice punish, but uh, Silver Fox, without any meter, found a throw reset instead. And Silver Fox, looking pretty foxy, taking all these rounds consecutively. You know, when Silver Fox name was revealed to me in the bracket, I didn't expect that they'd actually be a Silver Fox. Right? I said the literally the same hair. thing when I met him last week. Yeah. He walked in the door, first words out of my mouth, I was like, Silver Fox, aptly named. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, but uh, nice performance by Nero. You could see some of the experimentation happening there. That is a difficult matchup for Anji, one. Two, Anji, not the strongest character in this title right now. So having to overcome your inherent character strengths combined with the fact that Leo is a problematic matchup for you makes for a difficult situation. Nero is going to get another opportunity here in the loser's bracket as they're going to end up playing against Sammy. And I think Anji versus Potemkin could end up being a better character selection choice for Nero to try to compete against. Yeah, yeah. We know about uh, Anji's very strong defensive tools, mm -hmm. like the auto guard effect on uh, on parry, and uh, you know, wake up uh, super is a great invincible option against a lot of Potemkin's tools. Right. We'll be learning more about that shortly as well. Yeah, I just uh, once again, as you see on the screen, uh, there are the ability for all of you to ask us questions at hashtag Ask Triggy. We do have a couple of questions that came in. I hear the Potemkin player is pretty cool. You know what? That's not a question. Uh, that's not a question, but it is a true statement. Uh, yeah. I only met Sammy through this event, but yeah, you know what? I think they're pretty cool too. I also see I love dolphins. Agree to disagree. I don't need to see May on my screen. Alex is grandfathered in. I knew him before I disliked May. You know, I think I might hate dolphins more than I hate May. And, uh, you know, we don't have to get into too much graphic detail here, but if you ever do any research on some dolphin habits and oh, cultural practices, I mean, they are really disturbing. <laughs> and then uh, we also have a question. Someone asks three five Ks. So that is a reference to uh, the button notation of this game. Uh, first of all, the, the buttons are P, K, S, H, and D, which is punch, kick, slash, heavy, slash, and dust. Those are your inputs. And when we say 5K, we're using what's called numpad notation. Now, if you look at your computer and you have that number pad on the side, like on a calculator, Five is your controller input in neutral, and numpad notation means that you use the numbers to describe the motions on the joystick. So 5K means you are just standing and performing a kick button input. Similarly, you could do a 2K, which is crouching, yep. or you have special move inputs, which would be like 236, which is a quarter circle forward, which any of you that have ever thrown fighting, a fireball. Yeah, if you've ever thrown a Hadouken in your life, uh, that is 236. And the reason that people use this input is because it is a very convenient way to write out combos and block strings as a way to help to educate your fellow players and disseminate tech and information. While we're studying fighting games, we're probably near a keyboard where we can see True. the number pad on the bottom of the keyboard. And uh, we have those all across all the different regions, so it proves to be pretty universal. And uh, one character who is Japanese canonically in Guilty Gear this is, is a segue. True? Yes, Andre is uh, canonically Japanese. Oh, that's why he has superpowers. Yes, that's why he has superpowers. All Which is know about true that in the Guilty Gear lore. lore. That's and true. it also was a Japanese push to get us to use numpad notation when talking about fighting games. So here's Andre, a bunch of his special moves. You might hear us using numpad notation to refer to them later. Angie is a well-rounded character that uses invincible dances, which lead into a wide variety of tools and punishes. Angie's Auto Guard is a skill unique to him. Some of his special moves make him dance, preventing damage and forcing an opponent to finish the attack as if it missed Angie entirely. Angie can activate this dance as a standalone move or as a startup to Ko and Fujin. Ko sends Angie into the air while Fujin is a heavy hitting ground attack that can be followed up with one of four attacks. Between a fast attack that gets him to safety a high and low attack to challenge an opponent's guard, and a quick forward jump to set up a throw. Armed with a great knockdown game, invulnerable advances, and a toolkit to make a Swiss Army Knife blush, Angie is great for any player wanting to leave their opponents with turntables in their eyes. There you have it, a brief introduction to Anji. You're gonna see Anji again because we're coming at you next with the loser semis, which means Nero is gonna be back in there as well as Sammy for that Anji Potemkin matchup, as you can see there on the bracket. Waiting in the winner's finals is Silver Fox 
and Alex Smith, but don't get it twisted. They both still have more ahead of them even after the winner's finals because as we've explained earlier, this is a double elimination bracket, which means whoever wins that matchup still needs to beat one more competitor at the end of the evening before they're able to take the, the title for today. Yes, and while we're talking about bracketology, uh, the science of running brackets, I just wanted to put forward any of you aspiring TOs or tournament organizers out there oh. should follow the example being set here tonight yes. at Triggy because having losers semifinals run before winners finals uh, can be interesting in that if the winners finals match is played after, they must immediately play in losers finals against the losers semifinalist. And uh, I think often that makes for great drama and entertainment. And sure. th that's the kind of thing that we're trying to produce at Invitationals. But some TOs argue for the opposite to give the winner's finals loser a break. And uh, But we're, we're all about the entertainment and oh, the are. informativeness here. Not where I thought you were going with this. I thought you were going to open the can of worms on the upper lower debate. Oh, well, you know, I believe that anyone who loses in fighting games is simply a loser. <laughs> that is... In some ways, the nature of competition, but it's a double limb bracket. You have another chain. Yeah, I've been a loser. Most people are a loser twice. Oh, I've I've lost countless times. I yeah. I there's a reason that I sit in this chair and not those ones. Oh, I sit in both chairs. I know you do. Yeah, there's a reason. But you know, we feel like less of a loser here, guaranteed. <laughs> That's true. I I lost. I won no games, but I also lost no games. Yes, it's true. Yeah, we see both of them coming in. Anji and Potemkin. So I think you had called out while we were watching the video, one thing you observed is that you kind of wish that we saw more of the empty hop option represented from Nero. And I, mm -hmm. I have to say, I agree. Over the span of the matchup against Silver Fox, we saw the overhead come out so much and Silver Fox, it took until game three before they were finally blocking it. Yeah, and punishing too. Right, but the nature by which Silver Fox is waiting specifically for that move, and it was only in game three that Silver Fox started uh, challenging with his own 2P in the gap. Uh, you can cycle your pressure back either with, you know, empty Fujin at a good range and trying to stagger pressure or with that short hop after to catch him guessing. Oh, oh okay. We, I, I believe it's character locked, right? I think so too, but I know Nero enjoys playing Biken and I also know that we played some casuals uh, last week and Nero was very excited to play the new character Testament. We do still see... The Anji on display here. Mm. The Neon Lights uh, PS4 color Anji. I remember uh, in Guilty Gear Exert, these black and blue neon colors were exclusive to the PS4 version. So I call it the PS4 version, even though we're well, playing they on are PS5. Uh, but they're exclusive to the PlayStation versions here. You don't have those costumes on the Steam version. Really? Yeah, wow. I, I, to my knowledge. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense. But there's going to be cross-play in this game soon, which is a great tool that developers can implement to merge player bases that are otherwise split. So if any of you want to get this game and you're worried about being able to play with your friends on PS4 or PC, in just about a month or two, I believe that won't be any concern. Yeah, that's actually that's very true. And that's going to be coming with, I've, I alluded to Testament, who is the newest and final DLC character for the first season of this game. But we are getting a season two of DLC, which looks to have four new characters. We don't know who they are yet, but presumably that will also come with some balance changes. And we can expect a lot of that information coming forward in the next couple of months. So if, if any of this has piqued your interest, it is a good time to start to get warm and get your feet wet in this game. Speaking of getting your feet wet, that fire, the slash right off the rip, Nero really willing to represent that tool at round start position. We saw the same start against him. Feet wet because they're covered in blood. Those Anji fans really surprisingly sharp. If you see that counter hit hit spark, I, c I sometimes imagine it as blood, not going to lie. I mean, he's shooting Anji in the chest, and his chest is very exposed, but simply too many abdominal muscles there on the body of Anji to really do too much damage. Right, there's a reason Biken wants to meet him so badly. Yes. Getting the combos going, pushing Sammy back to mid-screen. I'm a little disappointed at that side switch. You were slowly pushing Sammy into the corner. The side switch, Ooh. unfortunately, corners you. Has to spend the hero burst. Well, it doesn't again. have to, but chooses to with full faith. And Nero does have some meter. Uh, didn't get a chance to build that 50 tension. A big 6-H. Potemkin's biggest and slowest punch to deal a pixel of life. I always find that funny when a move is such overkill. Oh, wow. We went for a, a 5D mix on Sammy's wake-up. But Sammy being a little bit disrespectful on wake-up has not been conditioned to wait for Nero at all. It goes for the switch. The, the back Mega Fist this time to generate a little bit of space. Ooh. Very different tone than we saw in the Silver Fox matchup, which is interesting at how much more aggressive Megafist worked out for Sammy there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Megafist on contact there, though. 
Sammy held on to the meter rather than spending RC, which does provide a guaranteed combo on any hit so long as you spend it. So basically, anything Sammy does, there's a PRC, a great way to kind of freeze the screen. Sammy went for an anti-air 2H, but was out of range. Might have needed to try Heat Knuckle on the other side with Tenkin's anti-air grab. But uh, Mega Fist back to mid-screen. You know, I think the nature of this game right now is Nero trying to approach, whether through the air or on the ground with buttons, and finding themselves walking Ooh. in to the buttons that were... I uh, see. Yeah, the will to keep winning. Uh, a favorite read of Sammy, pressing buttons just like Daigo does to keep people at bay, using Potemkin in a kind of defensive manner, and yeah. uh, it's working out well. I would have them. loved to read that book, but somebody went and bought like 17 copies of it and it, and it ran out. That's old fighting game lore. That's such an old joke that's for nobody but me. Yeah. Wow, uh, Biken, here, okay, I see somebody else got the joke. Awesome, the character switch over to Biken here from Nero, a very different matchup. Biken, a very different intro too. Look at, oh, look at right. these cinematics. We're watching I, a Kurosawa film right now. I forgot about this. This is the coolest thing about Biken. Oh, it is. And I'm not saying Biken's not cool at all. This is just the coolest thing. I mean, have you ever seen a game ooze style like this? She just cut color back into the game. It's it's wild that of all the characters in the cast, she is the only one to get that level of unique treatment. So a very different character, uh, different uh, air approach tools. I don't know how much we'll see Tatami. Nero played a little bit of Biken uh, last week, and we didn't see a whole lot of Tatami. But one of the unique mechanics for Biken is every time you see Biken throw Ooh. up that grapple hook, there is a chance to activate a tether mechanic, which you saw there for a second. And the tether mechanic will Here it is. pull the other person back into them, which you just saw there. Sammy whiffed the grab, and the tether pulled Sammy back into it. It gives Biken the opportunity for interesting combos or interesting punish opportunities that the rest of the cast doesn't get. I will say, I think the most conventional use of it, from, I've seen from other Vikings, is for mix-up opportunities, as uh, you have very ambiguous Exactly jumps. like that. Yes, yes, yes. And in a game where you have to hold the back directional button to block, cross-ups are a very valid mix-up option. They uh, can, are difficult to anti-air, they're going over you, and they're ambiguous. I mean, sometimes you might as well just guess on which side Biken's yeah. going to land on you when tethered. Yeah. Same way you have to guess against Potemkin when he's close. He's going to be pop buster in or close slash in, which will it be? Uh, Nero has a, a habit that I think both players they've played against are taking advantage of now, which is going for throws at point blank, even after, say, landing hits or being so plus that the throw is not actually available. And by plus, I mean uh, can move first. Yeah. But because throws are so fast in this game, if you're ever so advantageous against your opponent and move first, you can be too early and they just win. And the throw ends up getting punished. There's a good there's defensive a good throw. Of it. And there's the Midi Tatami here. We saw the, the grapple throw hook that time stayed. But what you can see is it produces this almost rubber band effect. That's going like, through. Oh, That's going through. Super. Oh! No, it didn't. And a small combo pickup and the OTG Mega Fist to kill. Great conversion from Sammy. Resourceful and situationally aware made the most of a, what is otherwise a scramble situation. We had no idea what was going to happen. I was actually fully expecting a hero burst from Nero. I love that Nero comes on to the burst to go into this next round. One critique I want to levy against Nero is Nero's uh, approach has been very linear so far. It's a lot of air dash into JH. Yep. And the problem is it's hitting so high up that I'm not completely convinced that they're plus when they're landing. Sammy's just kind of letting them get away with it anyway. Mm -hmm. But if Sammy becomes wise to that approach and starts representing these eight years more, oh, that's it's going to be really hard. That is going to combo. You're exactly right. No, it's oh, not. What? That needs the wall. The yeah, I thought the tether was on too. I really don't know where it went. Maybe the maybe it comes off. There's that anti-air. Great 6P. I mean, Patekin looks like he's praying when he does the 6P, but I assure you Sammy's pressing it with the utmost confidence. And... Uh, a little bit more confidence, and we'll see Sammy canceling that 6P anti-air normal into Heat Knuckle for a full combo off of an anti-air. Right. I, I like that Nero is varying up the approach a little bit. Kill. Sub, that is the kill on the OTG. But we did see Nero changed up the approach, used the Tatami rather than the JH, and is starting to use jump back JH as more of like a zoning tool. Great Try to use it as a farther reach, uh, you know, traditional normal, which I think, given the range that the Temkin has, works out decently well. Yeah, and who it wants gives to them move the opportunity towards? to challenge the armor of uh, Slide. Right, which Sammy's definitely using a lot. Oh, Heat Knuckle! There we go. Yeah, very familiar with how Nero likes to move forward. And they need to see some more retreat, or maybe Nero just kind of holding their ground, because as of right now, yeah, the run-up was great. A nice disjointed choice of normal on 2S. So Sammy's gold birth whiffs, and now Nero has a great offensive opportunity wow. to wake up Dust. Some things happen sometimes. So my guess is Sammy expected the cross-up and went for back 
dust, which dust is also the throw tech button. But given that the cross up didn't happen, if it turned into 6D instead of 4D, then it, no, it still would have been. It still would have been throw because both directions were throw. So, hmm. uh, you know, things happen sometimes, and honestly, making conjecture gets a little difficult. But right now, we should focus on the present, where each character basically has a pixel counter hit slowdown on that very high JS gave Nero a great combo opportunity. As you can see, the game slows down on every counter hit, and that actually adds hit stun to each hit, giving the player a chance to land a bigger combo. That same jump in landed earlier, and without the counter hit, the combo wasn't there. Nero's playing a very different ground game now. The air approach is after, especially after the, the heat knuckle anti-air, you can see that Nero slowed down and is playing more of a ground game. The reversal super here works out. That is unburstable damage, but Sammy's definitely going to burst on the next hit. That is exactly what happens. But that ju early jump in still representing it as a threat. That long range 6P flash cancel, kind of a, a great way to... Oh, didn't get in range of the 2H combo, and Nero found a small whip punish with Dust. A super still here for Nero. Counter hit combo on the retreating jump in. A familiar way to win both rounds. Nero takes their first game. And there's that special win screen from Baikin. Saying something over to the opponent with a big smile, and I'm sure both of them enjoying themselves. Just as much as Brad and I are. Camera's not on us right now. We gotta get back on this game. But we got big smiles on too, don't you? Yeah, I, I, I see criminally few bites. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the ones that I do see, you know, I encourage them to act as criminally as possible, right? In fighting games, often the battle is about how much you can get away with. Oh, yes. Without letting your opponent truly know what's happening. Just barely. I don't know if that Getting was just away barely out of Buster. range or if the URC didn't slow down Nero enough to prevent the up back. But uh, I, I like the... Oh! oh! I was going to say, we hadn't really seen that represented from Nero, but Viking has a bunch of unique counter options. Yep, and uh, that, that's the foremost among them. Here's a super applying some chip damage from full screen. Will this actually reflect the, the musket or the shotgun? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how that would interact. I think it'll just dissipate them, kind of like a oh, fireball war. I love that YRC didn't want to deal with the mix-up situation after blocking the mirror and slowly inching out of the corner. That risk gauge still kind of high. The OTG is just barely not going to kill. I don't think you needed to burst there. The combo was over after the OTG. I guess you burst there and it pushes them away so you're not dealing with the OT after the Mega Fist. Yeah, it's possible that Nero could have just landed one more slightly converted hit and won the round, but you know, we, I'll still qualify that as a hero burst, which in conventional Guilty Gear terms is more of a criticism than a, uh, than a compliment. I know sometimes referred to as a Cali burst. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's not as bad as, say, your burst whiffing or being blocked and then getting full punish, but, you know, that's something. Oh, great interrupt on the Mega Fist! The cleanest anti you can get, an invincible choice, and is this in range of wall break? Yes, it is. Extra damage and Okizeme, aka following up the knockdown with some pressure. Also going to get that positive bonus. You look at the bottom left corner of the screen. Nero is generating a whole bunch of meter for free after generating the wall break. You unfortunately do not get to bring that meter forward, so closing out the round on the tatami. And we are, this is still set point for Sammy, but Nero on the verge of bringing this back. This is not the way you want to start this round, though. Stuck in this P1 side corner, clean anti-air from Sammy. I think Nero needs to test their ground game. Absolutely. And it's, it's been the problem pretty consistently. 6P, so Sammy just got a little bit more time to nice. see that that JS was about to hit them in the face. The Tatami, but challenging intelligently after that 2D, 2D into Tatami on block, not real. Finding the 2D punish there, but the burst from Sammy. This is such a healthy life lead for Sammy. Uh, Sammy Nero. wants to pop buster, I promise. Wants to end the set with a pop buster and a firm exclamation point, but Nero has the burst advantage and corner advantage. Sammy's in the top spot. Can we see the wall break? There it is. Great pickup. Now, you definitely want to follow up here and put pressure on Potemkin. The only thing to be afraid of is, of course, that wake up mirror reflector, but you can throw that. Oh, run up gold burst! burst. The back dash, the PRC, you block the 2K, but you didn't respect the frame trap after the delay cancel of the 2D. So smart from Sammy. Yes. It was almost Nero's. It, it was almost Nero's. Nero's had more than enough tension meter to basically work the game engine into whatever they wanted it to be. Quite impressive and uh, a great display of the uh, leverless controller style from both players, by the way. I know some players might have questions about the kinds of controllers that we fighting game players are using and the kinds of different advantages and disadvantages one might have. The most conventional and classic of them all is, of course, the arcade stick. This yeah. one up here, uh, 
if you've ever been to an arcade, you've seen these. Uh, it's it's. We were talking about Silver Fox uh, growing up in the arcade days, and that's where he cut his teeth. That's definitely what he would have played on back in the day. I think Alex Smith still plays on one of these. Uh, you know, this is your directional input, and then you've got ascending strengths of buttons. Although at this point, uh, you have so many different button configuration options that you can use in these games uh, that you definitely have choices. Similarly, uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a push for something like this, which we refer to as a leverless style controller, uh, where instead of a joystick, these buttons are still your same face buttons that you would have had over here. But instead of a joystick, it emulates keyboard style inputs for left, down, right, and up is this big button down at the bottom. The reason for that being that in a fighting game, very often jumping is uh, a very committal choice, especially in uh, slower paced fighting games with less air mobility, like say your Street Fighters, or even, even your Mortal Kombat's to a degree. Obviously in a game like this where there's air dashing, you know, air mobility means jumping happens much more frequently. But so the idea was that putting jump in this different central location sort of emphasizes the importance of it. And some people prefer to use these types of controllers because you have a lot more explicit control over your inputs. I personally use a, a stickless style controller myself. Uh, you know, I, I grew up playing string instruments. And so that style of uh, execution just translated very well to my hands. Um, and then I know you play on uh, a regular PS4 controller. Actually, it's a PS5. Oh! I've, uh, I've worked my way up in the world to a slightly more expensive, heavier controller. You know, it's not quite as heavy as this. Right. It is definitely a little heavier than this, though. Right. I actually, I have not had the opportunity to use one of these. I use a different brand of, of stickless controller myself, which I think you would have seen Nero was playing in the other room. Um, and that's that's the sort of the older, the model that really launched that style of controller mm -hmm. to the competitive fighting game community, which would have happened, I don't know, when did when did the stickless uh, controller stuff come I would out? say that was like 2010s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they were very new back then. Yeah. The original oh, we have brand one right being here. Hitbox. Here's the classic Hitbox. A lot bigger than this snack box, which is snack-sized. Yeah, the snack box actually, between being snack-sized, but also one of the differentiators for it, both of these other controllers use traditional Japanese arcade parts, which you would have found on old Street Fighter machines back in uh, in the, the old Vulix, I think was what it was, the Vulix controllers, which would have been like old school Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter 3, what you would have seen on those traditional machines. Um, yeah. if, you, if you ever played like Mortal Kombat or anything else in uh, an American arcade, you would be more used to the American style buttons, which I don't think really see as much play anymore. But the snack box actually uses keyboard style switches. So the snack box is for all intents and purposes a mechanical keyboard that is emulating the shape of these other stickless style controllers. Um, so this, the fundamentally, it's all about personal preference. There is no one that is any better than the other. For the longest time, people you know threw a lot of flack at uh, what, what we call the PS4 controller, we call them pad players. Yeah. But in Street Fighter V, uh, the first like three world champions were all pad players. That's Punk and Knuckle Dew and uh, Men RD all on yeah. PS4 pads. So, yeah. point being, it's just whatever is comfortable for you, whatever execution works for you. Some characters, uh, for example, might work better on one. I know a lot of people don't like playing grappler characters on a stickless style controller because mm -hmm. on a grappler, you tend to do a lot of half circle and full circle motions, which is not quite as conducive when the buttons are not laid out that way versus on a pad where you just roll your thumb or on here where you literally roll the stick around. It comes down too to personality and style. I think a lot of stick players love being able to press these loudly oh, maybe yeah. in between rounds. There's nothing quite like stretched. it. It was yeah. my first event back post COVID. The thing I found that I missed the most was being in the commentary booth, but hearing people smack buttons. There's a friend of ours, uh, Lucky D, who runs events up in Massachusetts, and he slams those buttons. Oh yeah. Old school arcade guy, double tapping buttons for the inputs, and you can hear them echoing through the whole room. I do see that somebody asked, how much do pads and these controllers uh, cost? Well, your pad, it's, you can buy third party pads that are not, you know, directly Sony controllers mm -hmm. uh, for PlayStation, and those can vary in price. I know Hori makes some, I know Mad Cats used to, I don't know that they do anymore. Maybe. Um, I'm not, I'm not but, exactly sure. But that would be the same price as whatever you get uh, with your traditional PS4, PS5 controller. Yeah. Some of these sticks can vary in prices. I bought mine used for 80 bucks, mm -hmm. but I know a new snack box now, you're looking at probably 150 plus. Yeah, yeah. Um, cheapest solution in the short term is definitely the pad. I will say that. Yeah. PS4 pad probably came with your console. 
60 bucks, PS5, 70. Um, however, a lot of people don't enjoy the non durability of the PS4 pad. Yes. They can have pretty broken in buttons after maybe a year or several months, depending upon how hard your thumb presses them. Mm -hmm. I didn't know myself to be such a hard presser, but I go through more PS4 pads than anybody I know, which yeah. is why I honestly switched to the PS5. It seems to be more durable so far. Yeah, there's a lot of that. You don't see that as much as with the arcade controllers, especially because, uh, you know, if one of these buttons fails or something, you can just replace them. Someone who is good for that is one of the players in our winner's finals, Alex Smith, which we are going to be cutting over to winner's finals, Alex Smith versus Silver Fox, but don't worry, the segue tracks. Alex Smith actually also spends a lot of time up in the community. Uh, performing maintenance and yes. repairs for these things. Actually, Alex uh, fixed my hitbox when uh, my USB cable broke. And I know back in the day of when the communities were sort of alternating Xbox 360 and PS3 tournaments, there was something called dual mods that were very uh, yes. prevalent, where you buy a controller, and because they were all first party, they worked with one console or the other. And then people found third party peripherals that you could install in order to oh. make them work on both. Oh, I see Alex has taken a look at the, the art of winning. It, the will well. to keep winning. I think the it's a, a community copy pr pr possibly here. I, I got to put some more respect on Daigo's book. Yeah, yeah, How yeah, dare yeah. I misquote it? Well, the art of war and the will to keep winning are possibly related texts in the path of a fighting game warrior. Like these two have proven to be winners finalists with a lot of experience and uh, certainly a will to win against each other. I mean, we're going to see them fighting tooth and nail. Yeah, so Leo versus May. what's going to be, I mean, they're both scrape-heavy characters. They're both, you know, want to be running stuff up in your face. There's a fundamental difference, though. I think May's mix-up game is uh, a narrower field that is more dangerous. It's much more traditionally strike-throw oriented, like you called out the command grab that she has uh, in her kit, or she has the regular throw, and we've alluded to it, I think, once or twice, uh, but one of the things about May is that she really wants to pump that risk gauge. Uh, which is the longer that you block without performing some other thing, the more the risk gauge goes up until eventually whatever you are hit with is treated as an automatic counter hit. Now, for those of you that are looking for the risk gauge, Guilty Gear Strive, with its rather minimalist HUD design, uh, made it a little bit harder for new players to see, but whether you're a new player or a new audience member, I'm going to be telling you to look under the life bar for a meter, very thin one, that turns progressively more pink and then red when it's full. And when it's red and blinking, the next hit is treated as a counter hit with full slowdown. The damage for the combo is unscaled, meaning you'll see a possibly 10 foot long red life bar. Both of these characters are pretty capable of cranking it, but I think Leo makes less advantage of it because he hits you more often. Right. Where when May hits you, it's one bigger deal. And that's kind of what I was getting at, right? Leo's game is much more, he's going to hit you a lot, but you're going to get a lot of opportunities to make defensive decisions. Yeah. Against May, you're dealing with the strike throw a lot, and then she hits you twice. Right. And that's all it takes. Silver Fox, off to a strong lead here, getting this early wall break, going to go in with the positive bonus. No burst represented from either player. I'm a little surprised that Alex representing the Totsugeki off rip, but it wasn't broken with a super, so it wasn't an advantageous situation wow. for Silver Fox. Both bursts burned really quickly. Burst for burst, tit for tat. I mean, uh, you know, Silver Fox was deathly afraid of the corner positioning, so I'd certainly understand uh, the decision, especially since there's not really much of a disadvantage going into this round two, knowing that Alex Smith spent the burst first. So you can just trust yourself to play well here as Silver Fox is doing, already having cornered Alex Smith, going for some stagger <laughs> pressure. Alex Smith knew a throw was coming, but it was out of range, so they both just whiffed in animation there. They probably want to forget about that. Another 6K into throw, Ooh. full charge just from Alex, yeah. and meters coming up for the follow-up here. This has a great knockdown. May can run up and get some good offense. Goes for a slide, but Leo Backdash is out of range. He's going down to die with all this meter. Didn't oh, actually just barely alive. Blue RC in the air. I think that had to have been a defensive choice of a Blue RC to slow Alex down if Alex had committed to something. If, say, the slide had come forward or an IAD, the Blue RC slowdown mm -hmm. would have caused Alex to whiff and given Silver Fox time to recover and punish. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it did not end up happening, and Silver Fox loses out the round for it. Silver Fox representing the reversal much more commonly in this one, and critically, the throw represented from ah. Alex, that cross-up Berserker Slash is throwable. That is the thing that you need to represent against Leo, or he's just going to bulldoze over you left-right. Yes. Uh, bulldozing, though, mostly being done by this massive pink wheeler. Great knockdown for May. She can dash right in following on the Dolphin. 
And uh, Burst is possibly going to get taken. Whoa. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Alex is such an old head at gear. The second that combo started, you and I both knew that a Burst bait was coming. The thing yeah. about Burst, a, a very important defensive mechanic. However, there are moves that the Burst won't punish. And if you get caught out on it and the other player forces you to Burst in a way that they're able to block, you are eating a big punish mm. for that. The most conventional way to block and punish a Burst is to use a move in your combo that is jump cancelable. Guilty Gear is an anime fighter. These games typically have air blocking. So rather than continuing your full sequence of hits in your combo to try and kill the opponent, when you know they have burst and you know they want to spend it to survive, you do your jump cancelable hit, Mankind cancel your jump, block in the air, that burst comes, and it is full punishable as Alex Smith demonstrated. Silver Fox might have to be more careful and might have to hold on to the burst for less time because in those last hit situations where you still have your burst, it becomes more obvious when you will be forced to use it because you're simply out of life. In fact, my opinion uh, with bursts in this game, because they come back on a timer, I think an early burst is one of the smartest calls that you can make. You make an early momentum burst, and it's that much more likely that even if the matchup get, is very explosive, it's that much more likely that you'll get the burst back. PRC does not get anything out of it, representing that 6P, a nice healthy life lead here. Alex with the hero burst this time. Yeah, I mean, trying to prove some kind of point that was denied by the point that Silver Fox made. Yes, I can 6P anti-air. Yes, you'll be knocked into that back corner. And Silver Fox wins this round with the burst advantage. Now a two meter tension advantage spends the first on the red Roman cancel. Moving Alex towards the corner. Wall break's available. Let's see the super. Nice. Now it's always advantageous to knock them to the wall with the super because you are rewarded with a better knockdown. And unfortunately, even though that knockdown is supposed to be more rewarding, Alex Smith with the defensive savvy Ooh. to throw that uh, cross up dash from Leo from back turn. Yeah, the staggers, but Alex was ready for the follow up on that dash after. He was ready to cheat their way out. We've got some bar. Oh, 5P Nash, but Silver Fox wasn't ready to follow oh! up. Oh! No! Wow! Oh, what a scramble. Silver Fox still has a meter. Are okay. seeing here, but not able to kill. Watch the scaling and burst is there too. Okay, that time at least you had to burst. As you can Ooh. see, Alex with only one uh, round left to lose, and that will do it. It is going to be one game apiece here as Silver Fox closes out this game two rounds straight. Yeah. And, and I, I think a little bit scrambly there. There were, I mean, that raw DP that uh, whipped with all of that meter on deck after the gold burst, half of the advantage of being able to represent your reversal while you have bar is PRC means that you can choose to use reverse. Oh! Oh, gold burst represented once again from Silver Fox. I love that active choice being made. Yeah, and it was very fortuitous because May just happened to be moving forward at the time the Silver Fox activated the burst, meaning Alex Smith got bursted into the right corner, where he's now being returned forcibly by Silver Fox, who still has the meter advantage from that gold burst previously. Yeah, Alex is... It seems like Alex is fundamentally just struggling on the ground game here. What we're really seeing from Silver Fox is switch sides. the fact... Yeah, finds the side switch, drops the combo, though. Nice 2P mash from Alex to get out. That was pretty close to getting 6P, but Silver Fox was hesitant, so Alex Smith got to land with the jump in. Fighting their way out of the corner pretty brutally. Why is there Silver Fox to backdash after getting hit by the dust? It was an uncharged dust, meaning not so much advantage. Oh, that's a combo pickup. Could have killed with a 2P two, uh, two and the far H, but uh, Alex Smith with the uh, kind of scramble instincts. He's often the first to press a button faster oh, yeah. than you in situations neither player is familiar with. And that aggression is always rewarded in fighting games. You can't win by doing nothing. You have to be active. In fact, that's uh, doubly true in Guilty Gear. Some of you may have seen that Silver Fox's character portrait was scratching with danger in that last game. Uh, if you back off from the opponent for too much, there is a mechanic in the game where you cannot run away. Uh, for too long, or the game will reward you with a meter penalty. Or to, punish you, really. Yes, punish you with a meter penalty, rather. Uh, so, in the same way that breaking the wall gives you a bonus to your meter game, running away too much give, comes with a demerit. That 2k poke from Alex after the well-spaced Totsugeki earns the second game point here for Alex. 2-1 to one over... Silver Fox in this winner's final set. Yeah, I think we're going to start seeing more of that low option from Alex Smith because Silver Fox has been using a lot of wake-up backdash to forcibly return to neutral. And to do the backdash input, your stick is in the four position, right? And from just moving backwards, you can't be blocking low, which requires you to hold it down and back simultaneously. It's very common in these games that if you suspect that your opponent is going to move backwards, you use a low poke 
to catch them for it specifically and gradually encourage your opponents to sit still and block in place, which affords you more opportunity to start your offense. Alex has plenty of opportunity to start the offense, but the gold burst represented once again from Silver Fox, burning all that meter straight away. A YRC from Alex nullifies oh. Silver Fox's entire tension, but that 6P on the Totsugeki still anti-airing. You called it out in Alex's first match of the day. The cross-up goes unthrown. The overhead with the low poke. Silver Fox closes out the round. Can't forget that back turn overhead from Leo plus on block. Alex Smith swings anyway. You see he got counter hit clean by that Silver Fox 2P. Back from punch. Great low option. Alex's uh, finally getting wise to the prevalence of the reversal option from Silver Fox. Oh, oh charged that's by dead. B, no burst, you're dead. Actually, Leo's got guts. He'll, he's alive, he's alive. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Guts being a factor where your character seems to have more life the lower their life gets. They take less damage. It kind of can enable you to make comebacks or feel like you're making a comeback. And it also makes the spectators and commentators not exactly know when everything is going to kill, which is exciting. Nice throw from Silver Fox, who has a great meter advantage. And, you know, like a patient Guilty Gear player, not always immediately spending the meter as soon as it's available. And that enables you to be building more meter in the long term. That tension, almost full now for Silver Fox, still continuing offense without using it. And, you know, I want to draw attention, too, to the fact that when you spend Roman Cancel like you just did, <gasps> your meter gain penalty... <gasps> oh, and it's a completely... goes unbursted. I mean, Alex Smith had burst and could have chosen to survive, but... He didn't spend it, maybe assuming that Silver Fox would try to bait the burst. Well, so Silver Fox's entire offensive structure there off the close slash in the corner, catching as an anti-air right into the jump, which you would call out the jump chance of the normals. But then every tool that Silver Fox used after that, one, was burst save, but two, Silver Fox had meter. Another way to bait the burst in this game is to use a tool and then immediately Roman cancel into nothing. And the Roman cancel will allow you to block the burst and punish it. So Alex was expecting Silver Fox to more Ooh. actively burn the base, but instead Silver Fox just spent the entire combo and made the whole thing burst safe. He didn't need any more damage. Big corner confirm here for Alex, but does not have the meter for the more advantageous wall break. Someone really should clip that because uh, you just spoonerism yourself. I don't know if you noticed, you said burnt the base. It was pretty I did. fun. Yeah, I did. I, I wish you yeah. hadn't drawn attention to it. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I am drawing attention to the fact that Alex Smith, despite all of this, is on set point right now. Yeah, yeah, but a set could immediately go to final game, last game, last round. Silver Fox has burst advantage, and Alex Smith wrist gauge, that pink bar under the burst gauge, is getting cranked. Gold Burst represented once again. The Berserker Slash into the early PRC. That seems to be the answer for Silver Fox in some ways because the Berserker Slash keeps getting thrown by Alex. And I think that variability in the ground game is part of what's giving Alex pause. There's that slide right into the RC, but the DP represented. I wish Alex would represent throw as a meaty because yes. you called out that you are safe from throws on your wake up. But if you go for reversal, you can be thrown out of your upper. Yep. The only fully invincible moves are those supers, and they have a very high cost. And super did not come out on Silver Fox's wake up. Couldn't protect himself, whether with super or flash kick, DP. The invincible moves weren't there. He goes down with the meter. Alex Smith advances to winner's side grand finals. Silver Fox will be playing Sammy in the uh, S versus S matchup. That'll be a, uh, a slobber knocker for sure. I mean, uh, Leo and Potemkin point blank characters having a blast and uh yeah, I you know think, in their ideal ranges all the time yeah and well i think in that matchup though right is uh potemkin can definitely contest at the range where leo wants to play from but leo i think just natively operates faster as a character so i think it's easier in that range for leo to generate the ad advantage for themselves i, I want to say one thing because uh, we didn't end up talking about what a dp is dragon uh, dragon punch, punch. Uh, it is a shorthand that in the fighting game community we use to refer to invincible moves. Uh, you'll find a lot of moves have shorthand names that are based out of Street Fighter 2. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Shoryuken, or the Dragon Punch, was uh, Ryu and Ken's uppercut move, uh, which uh, they performed back in Street Fighter 2. So DP has become the shorthand that gets used to refer to any move that is invincible on startup and you just kind of have to respect. Traditionally, these moves are unsafe if they are blocked or if they whiff. Uh, in Guilty Gear, you have the Roman cancel mechanic, which allows you to make certain choices to help to alleviate that. For example, uh, Leo, if he has the 50 tension, can use his reversal and still purple Roman cancel the recovery so that he isn't stuck waiting when he lands and gets punished. Uh, that is one of such questions that can be asked 
with hashtag AskTriggy to send some questions our way. And we do have a couple more here. I see Potemkin is the people's champion. That would be true, but he is lacking the crucial people's elbow. It's true. I think uh, he's got a lot of crowd pleaser normals. I'm particularly oh, yeah. partial to 6H, that yeah. double punch. 6H is great. There's nothing quite like uh, a bunch of uh, Garuda pressure. Once again, that is hashtag AskTriggy, which you can see down in the lower third of the screen if you have any questions that you want to send over to us. We do have another question, which was asked, what is a frame? I think we've made a couple yes. of references to frame data. We frame can't help advantage. it. We can't help it because that is the unit by which we measure time in fighting yeah. games. So fighting games run at 60 frames per second. Uh, the games are virtually always rendering at 60 frames a second. And so what happens is every time a move is performed, you know exactly how to count how many frames are spent blocking it or recovering from it, etc. Mm -hmm. A native side effect of that is that once you block a move, one character is able to perform an action a set amount of time before or after the other player, which we refer to as being at frame advantage or frame at disadvantage. Which we shorthand as plus or minus. Yeah, and the idea being that if you have frame advantage, it gives you carte blanche to control the state of the game a little bit. We generally refer to this as you know, it being your turn and you have the ability to take your turn. While you have plus frames, uh, if they try to hit a button and you hit a button as soon as you're able to, yours will come out first and stop them from being able to act. So a lot of what happens, particularly for some of the characters that we've seen here today, like uh, Potemkin represents it on uh, Garuda, Leo uh, has it, Maze Close Slash has it, which yep. is what enables her whole ground game. But a lot of what happens in the game is different people uh, making sure that they are understanding and making decisions based around who has frame advantage, whose turn it is. We even referred to stagger pressure a little right. bit earlier today, which is uh, the act of taking a move that is not plus on block, but because of the threat of follow-ups of it, the perceived threat of those moves gives you enough respect that you could still perform another move. Uh, once again, that is hashtag AskTriggy down there in the lower third of the screen if you want to send more of these questions to us. I know both of us talk about this stuff all the time, so we could honestly sit here and just talk about the finer points of, yeah. of fighting games. It flows naturally. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, uh, we we talk about the stuff, and we even talk about talking about the stuff. That's true. That's yeah. true. There's nothing quite like uh, being... A, I, I don't know how many more layers deep you can go. I, I guess we're about to. I was going to say, is there a layer deeper than being on a podcast talking about fighting games? But we're on a fighting game stream talking about podcasts and talking about fighting game streams. So we found a third layer. Fighting games are all about layers. All of, the, all of mm -hmm. this information that we're supplying at once um, is active all at the same time, yeah. right? So like, I go to attack my opponent while they're knocked down. They wake up and use a dragon punch and beat my meaty attack. How about next time I do nothing, right. I block their dragon punch, and I punish it because, of course, an invincible move has a big drawback, like being deathly well, punishable should. on block. It could be, right? be soul slash DP. Yeah, or maybe they have tension meter to red Roman cancel their invincible attack, mm -hmm. and now, even if I block it, it's still their turn. Well, I better make it whiff then so they can't cancel it, right? Right. And that's sort of the, the way that a matchup plays out. We've talked a lot about character matchups, which we had uh, all of us, uh, thankfully, with this being an invitational. One of the advantages of an invitational for a player and, and for a, an analyst, a commentator, is that you know what character matchups you're getting when you come into it. Uh, so you have the ability to sit there and, and think about and contemplate these different character interactions, which is to say, you know, we talked, for example, when Silver Fox and Nero played, we talked about the fact that the interaction of Leo's reversal versus Anji's Fujin very much goes in Leo's favor. And there's a lot of these different nuggets of information that make up how a matchup works and will make for certain character matchups to be very good or very bad for a particular character or a particular player. Yes. And with our examples about Dragon Punch and uh, frame data and, and layers involving so much of these uh, invincible options, right. We would like to show you now a Leo video that will probably demonstrate the wonderful advantages of having an invincible charge motion DP or flash kick and uh, a bunch of other wonderful tools. Here's Leo in Guilty Gear Strive. Leo is an aggressive fighter who can enter a back turn stance to mix up his opponents and unleash more powerful attacks. Leo's tools include a multi-hitting projectile, 
an uppercut that works as a reversal, and lunging attacks that can pass through an opponent. Leo's main tool is his back turn stance, which can be entered after a ground throw or after certain special moves. While in this stance, Leo cannot jump or block, but gains access to mix-up tools. Leo can counter his opponent's attacks with a shield, grab his opponent after a short dash, or strike with a powerful attack that crushes his opponent's guard. Leo's options between projectiles, reversals, and mix-ups make him best suited for players who want to unleash the power of an army from a single man. Sorry, I was in back turn. It's my ideal state to function in, just like Leo White Fang. Uh, I don't know why I even turned around. Shouldn't I be in back turn right now? You should probably be in back turn the whole time. The threat generated from back turn. I, I am. Uh, so I play a character that doesn't get uh, great tools off of his uh, off of his five P. So I particularly hate uh, back turn because you you kind of have two default modes, right? You either want to immediately challenge and hope that they didn't counter, uh, or you just sit there and and hope. I am firmly in the sit there and hope category. It is a fundamental problem that I have as a player. My default defensive tendency is I sit there and I block, and then when I do have to make a decision, I tech throw. And of course, Guilty Gear is a game that just rewards offense and aggression. It's yes. kind of in its nature. And so the more time you spend blocking, you're not buffing your meter gain. Mm -hmm. They're probably hitting you. They're cranking your risk gauge. The game really wants you to act. Yeah, it is, it is far and away uh, among the most aggressive games that we see played, and that's been true over the lifespan of, uh, of Guilty Gear. This is um, this is the fourth, I think, uh, main uh, entry as a as a fighting game. There was a there was like an adventure, yeah, uh, overture yeah. action game uh, that came out, but it's always been a game that really rewarded you for offense and for uh, ensuring that you were the one being the aggressor. Fast movement, uh, aggressive moves, lots of damage. Yes, and of course the uh, the constant reward for you know mm -hmm. believing in yourself, right? I mean, this game asks you to put everything on the line. Oh, it, uh, yeah. it 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 it'll give you some per particularly strong, even like aesthetic and visual rewards for like oh. let's say when you finish around with your character's trademark special move, you get those unique voice lines. Oh, I love that. When I win with Wake Up Volcanic Viper with Soul Bad Guy, and he gives me ten seconds of Volcanic Viper. I'm so good. I actually, so I play, uh, I play Zato, who is a, a character that you're not going to see today, but he's a character that is, uh, he fights with a, a li his shadow is like a living creature, and, and he and the shadow fight together, and he's voiced by, if anyone is a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure fan, he is voiced by the voice actor for Dio. Oh, so when you huge. get, when you get that big wall break super kill, and he sits there and sicks the shadow at you, and you just hear Dio screaming, it's, yeah. oof, Very it's cool. a great feeling. Yeah. Well, uh, in terms of great feelings, there will be no shortage supplied by our bracket tonight. I mean, uh, one of these players will have a chance to play Alex Smith in a run back. Alex Smith sent them both to losers. It'll be a great feeling to get the chance to do that again. Um, you know, possibly a neutral to maybe bad feeling when you lose, but that's the nature of the game. It's one versus one. Somebody's got to lose. And yeah. thankfully, we can press rematch real quick most of the time when we're playing this game. So yeah. honestly, learning, even if you're losing, is always fun. Yeah, so uh, that is going to be Sammy and Silver Fox coming at you here on the Losers Finals. So Potemkin versus Leo, we've talked about it a little bit. Uh, I I got the chance to watch these two play in, in casuals last week. And one thing that I will say is at the time, it seemed to me as though perhaps Sammy wasn't fully versed in the matchup. And there's one situation that I call uh, attention to. We've already alluded to a couple of times that when Leo goes for that cross-up move where he dashes through you and hits you on the other side, you are able to throw that move. Uh, and as a grappler, it's even doubly important that you represent that because you get the throw, which is an important part of your game, but also it gives you frame advantage at a range zero situation where you could run your mix up. It's, it's Christmas. It's, right. it's your birthday. Pick a major holiday. It's gift wrapped right to you. Here was the problem. I think Sammy understood that that was the spot wherein you want to make a defensive decision and punish Silver Fox if you know that it's coming. Mm -hmm. But it takes anticipation it and does, reaction. But I also, I don't recall seeing Sammy actually using the throw. I think Sammy was experimenting a little bit and trying to find something else. And since day one, the answer has just been throw. That's the answer. I mean, we've uh, we referred to it as Berserker Slash. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Wolverine had that in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. It was the answer then, back in 2010. Yep. The, the sort of spiritual... I don't actually know if Leo had that move in Exert, did he? Oh, yeah, he did. Yep. Is same, that, was same that the one. answer in Exert? Yeah, yeah, always. It's a staple. Um, right. Well, Marvel came first. Of course Marvel 3 came first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's always been Berserker Slash, and he, he retains it here. But I think Leo functions at an overall faster pace in Strive than he did in Exert. Generally, rounds go faster in this game, too. That's true. Damage is high and or life is low, depending upon how you want to view it. And, uh, you know, we've got a cold stage here. I'm Potemkin dressed for the elements. I mean, Leo, he's got a big beard. He's got a big coat. You know, I think he'll be fine Yeah, he's here. fine. He's, 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 he's got boots with the fur. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I'm, I'm glad they're kind of dressed for the occasion here in this, in this winter stage, which is my favorite stage. In the oh, of course. Once again, Marvel 3, we played on Bone Wonderland. It was yeah, the snowy yeah. stage. If your game has a snowy stage, that's what I'm playing. Went for the jump, but actually got smoked by the burst anyway. Silver Fox keeps representing those comparatively early bursts. Finds the 2K 2D, and now we got to run the mix up. The trade, mm -hmm. that burst is great. It puts wow. Silver Fox back in the corner, but I wish that we had seen a different defensive choice. Yeah, spending all that meter from full screen against the projectile is a big loss for Sammy, who probably should have been spending the meter earlier on, say, uh, keeping oneself safe off of that advancing armor mood, armored move from Potemkin called Hammerfall. You'll see him kind of lunging forward, possibly screaming Hammerfall. And uh, it is punishable on block, and Silver Fox punished it first try. So Sammy has to be aware and cognizant and recognize when that move is being blocked and save themselves with the Roman Council. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's the choice you make with a move right, like that, right? Like, we, we kind of refer to moves like that. There's the throw! Nice throw. That's what I need to see, Sammy. Uh, we we kind of refer to some of those moves as, like, those are the, bu the bypass neutral moves, right? Yeah. But especially that one, right? You're either going through a normal and you hit them, or you need the ability to make yourself safe. Silver Fox is going to be able to close out this round. No, wanted to play for the tick grab. And we see that a little bit here from Silver Fox. You can see that he's really willing to not follow up on the strings and make very firm commitments to the tick grab. We've even seen a lot of like counter hit 6K connecting and we see nothing off of it. And I think that has like a target combo follow up. 6K, uh, typically you actually see it cancel into a special. Yes. Um, so you, you can see the Flash Kick Ender there, which is in range, and you can see uh, Berserker Slash, which has great range and will work from even further out. But uh, 6K on its own doesn't have any normal follow-ups. So it's got to be special canceled. Anyway, we got a nice uh, little break here for the pacing. It is uh, Silver Fox going up 1-0 after that first game. It happens quick in matchups like these, so yeah. if you ever spend a moment looking away, I mean, you know... Thankfully, you got commentators like us to rely on. We're uh, we're, we're really professionals <laughs> about this. No, commentators totally lose it all the time. I'm not gonna lie. No, I, I lost it last week in yeah. the in the tech run through. I definitely invented a game that didn't happen. Okay, yeah. that burst did happen though. Sammy wants to push back out of this corner. That continues to be the thing. I feel like this ground game is really going Silver Fox's way by and large. And I mean that's part of the difficulty, right? Leo just has. Uh, more, I think, ability to control the ground game. Uh, Potemkin needs to be a little bit more reactionary until they get advantage, and then they can start to press the issue. Right, and here is Sammy pressing the issue walking forward, but one tactic that you'll see a lot of Potemkin players use nice. to advance is after securing one of those long-range knockdowns, they'll use Hammerfall and stop it with a thing called Break, Hammerfall Break makes him end the move a little bit earlier, and it helps him gain space on the ground much faster than him walking. And he has no dash. He's one of the only characters in the game who simply cannot move forward as conventionally as everybody else. So finding the ways that you can move forward to secure your terrifying presence in front of them is critically important as Potemkin. Yeah, that's that's not that rare for grapplers, too. I mean, traditionally in, in the Street Fighter series, if you've ever seen Zangief, Zangief, Zangief. And yeah. that functioned similarly, where it was a move where half of its appeal was just as a movement option. We're seeing a lot more Flick represented from Sammy, which I oh. like. Because Flick is doing two things. This Potemkin Buster is doing plenty. I will circle back to this. Garuda gets DP'd on Wake Up. Silver Fox does not want to deal with it. Congratulations, you got some frame advantage. What are you going to do with it? Burst is going to be back for Silver Fox any second now. We're going to see a wall break combo here, which will give Silver Fox tension pulse. But Silver Fox contends against Sammy's 50 meter, which could be used... Ah, great cross-up block and YRC to put Silver Fox in the corner. Will Silver Fox Wait, burst he's again? Wait, he's going to DP. 
Yeah, he's going to DP. Silver Fox is DPing so much, and I really think Sammy needs to get wise to that. It smelled like uppercuts in here, and that's because there were uppercuts. Uh, but what I was going to say, Sammy was representing Flickmore, which I think does two things. One, it's serving as sort of a diet anti-air mm -hmm. for the lower approach that's coming out from Leo. Potemkin, a tall enough character that even a move that's not meant to be an anti-air can sometimes work. But also, Flick serves a dual purpose of firing the fireball back at them. So the fact that Silver Fox is backing off and using this fireball to keep Sammy moving slowly makes this flick work for both options and it makes it that much easier for him to sort of try to swing the game back into his favor Ooh, exactly like that yes and even a hammerfall follow-up didn't use the break and ended up a little bit negative while getting close but getting close is still the objective so i really like to see it from sammy and oh DP oh flash canceled it a butt bounce so Fox still held on to the burst though great fortitude because sammy didn't actually get a combo didn't get it either there we'll so take the burst uh, oh not quite. even i, I kind of baited the burst a little bit has to spend the bar to FD. You can die to chip damage in this game. So you see Silver Fox Ooh. using FD for two reasons. One, doesn't want to take the chip damage. And two, while that green shield is up, which is FD, which stands for Faultless Defense, while that is up, then when you block a move, it actually pushes the enemy a little farther away than normal. Silver Fox is actively making the decision to keep Sammy away from him. Back throw defensively on Wake Up from Sammy. Blue RC, the Garuda, were you still plus after the Blue RC? I think that Silver Fox tried to get a flash kick, invincible DP, reversal type move out in time and accidentally did it too early and thus lost the charge in place. Oh, well. maybe. And uh, Sammy did take some advantage of it, but Silver Fox is going to get a wall break and Sammy actually bursts. Could probably kill with one pop buster into a Roman cancel combo. Nice flick. Can now certainly I think kill with one pop buster. Kills. Yeah, it will. It absolutely will. I like that. Send that out. Force the issue. Oh, oh yes. I wish you had been ready for that Silver Fox with the Raffle Copter. But Sammy could have represented the anti-air. One of the advantage of using that type of a tool is it unilaterally controls the ground, yep. which means you can make the decision to watch. They either block it on the ground and you get a mix-up, or they go to the air and you punish them for it. It's a very traditional fireball trap that Sammy just was not ready for the varied option. The guard counter out of the back turn stance here from Silver Fox, and there's the red RC. They we're gonna get no we don't quite get to the wall but we're just about to get the tension the 6k and the follow-up after that is gonna close it out 3-0 for silver fox yeah really controlling the pace of the matchup the whole way i think that might have even gone a little bit faster than the uh winners finals match between uh, silver fox and alex uh, but nonetheless it was there were some very tight rounds there mm. and i was really enjoying seeing how much better uh, Sammy was starting to get at yeah. contesting in neutral and uh, making sure that every knockdown leads to some kind of point blank and close approach from Potemkin, the grappler, who didn't quite get to throw or pot buster against any of those no. flash pick reversals. But that is a very potent option in the matchup that if we would have seen would surely have led to one heck of a pop off from either of us and we might have even heard the heard the screams from that room over there <laughs> right well there's something to be said right you could see that silver fox was making a lot of very active defensive choices there's a lot of backdash a lot of defensive burst a lot of reversal and it really was only uh in that third game that we started to see sammy more actively playing around the reversal and i think it's a problem that's been struggling silver fox's opponents through the course of this evening i think silver fox has demonstrated over the course of the evening of real willingness to go to that reversal until dissuaded and i think it's taking people a long time to sort of tune into that and there are options for it in this game even with meter you can throw it on wake up yep and it doesn't matter how much meter you have it, it it's not safe if you throw it yep and uh one thing i wanted to draw attention to is just making preemptive analyses of the risk reward elements that are at play in when people yeah. choose to use their wake up invincible dp in the situation where Silver Fox had already won the first round of a game and could win the second round and thus take the game with just a single flick of an invincible attack, rather than, say, spending a burst and possibly being at a disadvantage right. for the next round, Silver Fox won that second game just with that, what I call a round two wake up DP. So you can win the two rounds consecutively and not risk having to play a third. Do your yeah. riskiest thing so you, while it won't lose you the game. Right. And, and that's, you know, I know we talked about it on uh, on the drive in today. Even there's a there's a level of interaction that a player can have with their opponent's kit in that way where you make those decisions rather than a micro decision where you're only looking at the situation, which I think a lot of people tunnel vision in on where you look and you're like, oh, Leo can go low. He can go high. He can 
throw out the counter, he can cross up, but there's macro decisions to be made in the moment too. The cross up becomes that much more valuable if Leo's back is to the corner because the cross up puts you in the corner. That immediately incentivizes the Leo player to prioritize the cross up as the choice to be made. Yes, absolutely. And a game that so heavily rewards corner pressure, you get things like the wall break, positive bonus. Right. I mean, this game is designed around both the corner, but also it re-emphasizes the importance of the mid-screen round start spacing. Yes. Because once you break the wall, you return to that exact space that the round always starts at most of the time, unless it was broken with super. And after the wall break, there's metered options on the table that make the round start spacing much more interesting and have a lot of depth. Yeah, and there's even, I mean, if you look at the highest level of this game, what I found really interesting is that we're starting to see certain characters in certain matchups where people are overtly avoiding the wall break because they have made the decision that the corner position is more advantageous. Some characters really don't want to go back to mid-screen against certain characters. I think May is like a, a decent enough example of that, right? Where like May gets you in the corner. Sometimes mm -hmm. a May player might not want to go back to mid-screen because it's like, sure, I have Totsugeki, I have a great 2S, I have uh, the beach ball as a fireball option, but if I just keep you in the corner here and deal with the wall splat situation and force another mix up, you could die on the next hit rather than uh, moving forward. And speaking of May, we have a little bit more information about her coming at you right now. May is an extremely aggressive pirate looking to overwhelm her opponent with a barrage of beach balls, capsizing command throws, and a tidal wave of lunging attacks. While lacking in defensive options, May has strong and fast normal attacks to rack up damage quickly or increase her opponent's risk meter. As a player blocks an opponent's attacks, their risk gauge builds. When a player is hit, they take bonus damage based on the amount of risk they have in their gauge. While all characters have this property, May's attacks build risk faster than many other characters. Once built, May's attacks will plunder her opponent of their life bar. May's relentless attacks and strong knockdown game is a great fit for players willing to sacrifice a defense for a strong offense. Oh, we're back. <laughs> well, we were just we talking were... about wall break strategy like we uh, pretty much always obsessively do. Yeah. I mean, if, if you talk to anybody that really plays fighting games like we do, uh, it, it is more or less all we do. And we have plenty more to talk about you uh, to talk about coming at you still because we have one more match. Let's take a look at the bracket here. The grand finals, a run back of winner's side, Alex Smith versus Silver Fox. And we've alluded to it a couple of times, and now we get to explore it. And given that the winner's finals was 3-2, such a close set, it may well happen. Alex, if Alex loses this set, it resets the bracket. So what that means for those of you at home that are less familiar with the double elimination bracket is they're going to play a best of five right now. But if Silver Fox wins, all that does is drop Alex into the loser side of the bracket. They are both still in the tournament. So Silver Fox actually has to win two consecutive best of fives in order to take this event right now, which puts Alex in a great position because you kind of have a set to play with. You kind of have a set to sit down, pay attention to your opponent's tendencies, and really get a sense for what you're doing and how best to approach this match. That means there could possibly be 10 games in this set, by the way. That's true. We could go the distance. That's always yeah. great. That that is, I mean, it is. It's the best thing you can ask for because character players get so much better at fighting each other and also learn specific things about their opponent's characters and what their character can do against their opponent through the course of sets like this where specific interactions become their kind of obsessions and fascinations. Yeah. I mean, as a great example for this, right? We were talking about Silver Fox's tendency towards DP. Uh, Alex started to get wise to that in the winner's finals. I imagine what we're going to see, at least in part of the grand finals here, is a re-emphasis of that because I don't think Silver Fox was thoroughly dissuaded through either winner's finals or loser's finals away from that as a choice just yet. It's hard to dissuade a Leo player from DP. That's also true. Some players are just stubborn. Sometimes that happens. You know, we, we told everybody about frame data earlier and the states of frame advantage and frame disadvantage, but there's also a joke in the community that uh, frame data isn't real. And what that really comes down to is we can talk about numbers, we can talk about what is the right decision to make in a particular situation, but at the end of the day, it's two players playing against each other and making active decisions. And the only right decision to make in the moment is the one that beats whatever your opponent did. 
And in that way, there's a large element of rock, paper, scissors that happens in a lot of these micro decisions that happen. And you can bring a lot of outside knowledge in, what your opponent's habits are, the macro game state of, you know, whatever might be the best choice in the moment. And all those things can influence it, but you both could still make the unoptimal choice and win. Yeah, and the best choice is often the most obvious one because we as players of the game and spectators too become so familiar with what states lead to a character's most advantageous position. As if a, a happy chaos player won't be so excited to return to neutral after a wall break, say, because they suddenly have all this space to begin yeah. throwing a curse at you and doing charge shot gun zoning. Kind of a hard character to explain to a beginner audience, but for those of you who are curious, uh, you know, you can watch some players like Ramala or uh, uh, Lost Soul, and, uh, you know, just make sure you know that fighting games have a wide variety of character archetypes. Some of them are playing shooters. That's true. Uh, another great Happy Chaos player is, uh, I believe it was Amisha. Umi Show, yeah. Yeah. Very uh, good. Great Happy Chaos player. Winning a lot of tournaments right now and enters everything. Yeah. Um, but so we are back here on the May versus the Leo, which you would have seen oh, Alex micromanaging the song selection. Great, great choice. Was that was that a, that's an old May theme, right? It's uh, the yes, it's the XX AC. I don't know if it's plus R in particular, but it is the one from that generation. Did they change themes between AC and plus R? No, probably not. So it's probably yeah. just uh, for, for those of you at AC. home, we're, we're referring to older entries in the in the guilty gear series as we said earlier this is the fourth of the fighting game entries yes alex has been playing them at least since the second i don't know how many people played guilty gear one on the ps1 i i don't really i think uh daigo played it i know that oh probably oh my god of course he did uh oh my god why am i drawing a blank on his name uh and a japanese streamer but he's an american guy uh, Why am I drawing a blank on his name? Um, is he, uh, I don't know. Um, You're drawing a blank on his name too. I don't feel bad now. Gold yeah, yeah, burst okay, from okay. Alex with the corner position. That's an interesting choice, but immediately gets the RC to try to bypass neutral. And I appreciate the call that he's made. He struggled on the ground game a lot. Is it Marlin Pie or no. SKD? No, he lives no. in Japan. Oh, lives in Japan. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Sorry. Well, uh, you know, the community is very wide, and you know, when, when we lose names like this, it's because we have so many of them in our head. Kind of like special move names. One of the toughest tasks of a commentator, learning all these names to properly identify them. In fact, I can't even tell you what the Leo DP is called. We just call it Flash Kick or DP. Two other moves in fighting game history that are quite invincible. And, uh, you know, blocked and punished their maps. Man. Alex is using a lot of... Uh mid charge or full charge 5p as like a poke. It almost looks like Alex is trying to use it as a spacing trap in certain ranges. Oh, how about that? Silver Fox trying to advance after blocking a full charge gust, which is indeed negative, but Alex Smith privy to Silver Fox's hunter instinct and just stuck out a big button for Silver Fox to run into, denying the aggression. Alex is definitely having a, a much easier time. Oh! Game. Went for the 2K check with the back turn counter. Works out great. Now Silver Fox in the driver's seat. The slide. Oh, Pierce Whoa! the RC. Alex is going to get burst back in a second. Just up backs, falls down with the anchor and closes out the round. Silver Fox dies with a burst, but he wouldn't have really had an opportunity to use it. The only way you get to use your burst in that round is Silver Fox is if you make a really gutsy gold RC, uh, gold burst, rather. Yeah. So definitely makes sense that he would have elected to try to save it for a round. Oh, someone said and gold burst? There you go. Yeah, there we go. I, they both really want this gold burst. I know Silver Fox did that a whole bunch in the winner's final. Oh, come on. Big punish opportunity, right? You got a BRC combo that slows down the opponent. I'm not sure Silver Fox recognized that Alex had gotten hit by the jump kick, so unfortunately that throw whiff for Silver Fox. I think and then now with, wow, that was actually a punish, so I'm not sure if Alex was so negative there off the Totsugeki or if another move of his was coming out and that got punished. But either way, Silver Fox returns to the neutral as a result of that DP. Nice whiff punish going right into the fireball, too far away to get anything else after. And I think maybe in part expects that Silver Fox might be holding some down back and ready for the DPs. Another oh, one! Whoa, so smart! Goes for the neutral jump after the PRC specifically to blow up Alex for the throw, but it doesn't end up mattering and Alex closes out the round anyway. But you can see the way Silver Fox is trying to construct this ground game and generate this oh. throw offense. I was going to say there was one lasting victory for Silver Fox and that was taking Alex Smith first pretty late in the round, but 
You know, it's not so much an advantage anymore now that Social Rocks came off of his burst and just got punished for it in this round two, which is very difficult to come back from. However, three consecutive hits, wall break mounting, super for the wall break. Let's see the super. Ah, unfortunately, I think a super combo would have killed there, so Silver Fox has a little bit more work to do. Oh, so just goes for Fireball PRC at round start position, catches Alex trying to cheat the round start position. If you don't break the wall with the super, you do not get proper Oki after the wall break. And you can see Silver Fox has completely changed the way he's constructing his offense. He's waiting longer for the Berserker Slash cancels and for the options out of back turn stance. And it's really blowing up Alex's tendency for when he wants to counter poke or when he wants to try to use movement mechanics. Mm -hmm. As we alluded to too, Silver Fox waking up with the Flash Kick and the Roman cancel to make it safe on block. And you know, Leo's wake up reversal has so much range too, oh! that back dashing away isn't so feasible. I mean, a titan of defensive options. We saw a counter as an anti-air. Counter, of course, immediately destroys strikes and rewards Leo with damage. So does Dragon Punch, a truly invincible option. So Alex does have to be very careful. And I think Silver Fox was using those two moves in perfect union with one another in that set. But a great burst from Alex Smith immediately corners Silver Fox. Silver Fox recognizes that corner. Wow, Alex corners himself with an unfortunate combo choice. So it's been a bit of a scramble here in uh, Game, in game three, round one, it looks like Alex is coming out on the better end of it with a highly unskilled combo into overdrive. That is a kill. Oh, it whiffed! It, I, I think that combo route can be a little weird sometimes, and I've definitely seen Alex drop it before. While really just letting those chain cancels rock, wants to generate a little bit of space. Great, six feet. six feet. Huge, and now this corner position, there's no defensive choice on deck for Alex. Has the meter to make the DP safe. Goes for the tick grab. That's another situation where Silver Fox is going for those tick grabs oh. early. But the 6P representation, the whiff punish on the 2S, but finds uh. the back throw. Does Alex? Silver Fox caught a little bit unawares, mistimes his meaty, and gets punished for it. But that was otherwise a great round for Silver Fox. Yeah, the sequence was mounting. I mean, Silver Fox fought that tooth and nail to bring it back. You, uh, you typically see flash kick from Silver Fox, still really kind of the star of the show. I mean, Alex hasn't been able to uh, get out of its way. Every time that it is blocked, Silver Fox has meter. So, I mean, you know, Alex Smith is a big DP enthusiast himself in the way of in when he plays games that have dragon punches, but with May, there simply is no option. So that was an attempt at a gold burst there. The whole point of gold burst is that when you use burst in a way that is not, you know, to cancel like block stun or something, if the burst connects, it fills your tension meter, which is what you use to do the supers and the Roman temple. Silver Fox is regularly using burst in spots where he believes that Alex is going to hit a button and try to take his turn. Oh, oh that's going to get whiff punished. That, the, do you see the teeth on that thing? That is a killer whale if I've ever seen one. But it didn't quite kill Silver Fox's tournament life here. That's going to be Alex Smith's responsibility with one more game in this set. He could be your Triggy champion. We're going to have to see. Silver Fox is playing this really well, and I think he's getting a whole lot of great sequences. What I'm going to say is I feel like what keeps happening is Silver Fox it miscalculates on just one spot, and the fact that May's offense is so much more explosive and Silver Fox is playing fast moves to the defensive choices is meaning that he only really gets the one mistake to make. Right. And that's something that's fundamentally true of these two characters. You get a lot of opportunities to guess against Leo because a lot of his offense that aren't the biggest for starters lead to small damage that adds up. May fundamentally does not work like that. She is cashing out big damage. Speaking of uh, not such a big starter. Oh, never mind. Huge starter. Let's let's talk about this instead. Definitely going to kill. Oh, even with the Totsukeki whiff. Maybe just some style there for Alex Smith advancing to tournament point in uh, in dominant fashion so far in this game. But, you know, games are only two rounds. It could turn around quick. As quick as a Silver Fox back turn mix up? Not quite. Alex Smith throws it preemptively. Really getting the better end of the throw exchanges now. Silver Fox was quite reliant on throw for his offense earlier, and it's not quite working as much. Silver Fox, I think if I'm Silver Fox, I want to play a little bit slower here. Okay, Great throw. finds our way in. Run this Oki. Your hope is that you lose your turn here only once Burst comes back, which will be pretty soon. Silver Full Fox meter for both players. Silver Fox is going to have Burst back just barely before Alex does. Alex, oh, Burst comes out on the side of Silver Fox, finds the cross-up, makes up Burst represented from Alex. Similarly... Great anti are keeping Silver Fox locked down, but a life lead for Silver Fox escapes the corner immediately crossing the other side. Let's see the wall break. Not quite enough damage. 
great choice. A needy normal. Alex Smith was trying to scramble away from a throw at any cost, knowing that the throw punish would have killed Silver Fox. Tutu Kiki right around start. It's the counter hit into the special stun state. Gets the combo after. You find the cross up, but right into the low short check. Alex is walking backwards. Cross up is going to come out again. No, actually, Silver Fox bringing out the layer two lets that block string go much longer before the cross up comes out. And it's like we talked about earlier. Sometimes the most optimal oh! choice is not the one that you need to make in the moment. Cross up putting Alex back into the corner once again. But scrambling. Silver Fox is scrambling. Let's somebody check Alex's ankles. And the most scaled starter throws a defensive choice. A throw lands for Alex. Command grab. Combo is available. Burst is back for both players, too. A gold burst could go a long way for making a comeback. I don't think oh, there it is. Oh gold my god, burst. dash up gold burst. You've got all this bar. Six no! P. Great. Buffer off 6P. A little bit of counter hit hits on slowed the game down enough for Alex to know that Totsugeki would deliver him to victory in the Tri State Guilty Gear Strive Invitational. He's your champion, and he's about to have a nice firm handshake with his opponent who fought so valiantly in both sets. I, Silver Fox, once again, even in that round, I feel like Silver Fox kept making these great decisions. Uh, the the development of Silver Fox's offense through the course of the set, the way that he was varying his timing in how he chose to follow up on certain uh, chains and strings and staggers started to really expose some of Alex's tendencies. Just the fact that Alex committed to that 6P in that position there, Alex made a high-risk call to say, I'm going to do this. If I'm right, I win the tournament. If I'm wrong, I'm not. it's not even a bracket reset. And that's a decision that you can much more comfortably make. I mean, you talked about, you know, the round two DP versus to avoid the round three situation. Yeah. That's the call Alex made, except it was for an entire bracket reset. It was like, yeah, I do this exactly. now, I win the tournament. If I'm wrong, I have another game before I'm even worried about losing. Yeah. That's a very comfortable position to be in as a player as experienced as Alex Smith is. Yeah, I also want to draw a little bit more attention to uh, 6Ps in general. We've been saying the name of this normal a lot, but it actually is one of the most unique normals across the whole cast of characters in Guilty Gear. It uh, has what's called upper body invincibility. Mm -hmm. So attacks that conventionally hit high on the opponent, they're often the longest range or faster attacks. They are intentionally countered by the 6P, that's forward and punch, which kind of like goes under them or around them you know sometimes yeah. it animates differently than others but either way it's more of a normal you press knowing your opponent is trying to press on you yeah. with a normal of theirs that they're moving in with yeah it's, it's a very effective counter poke uh traditionally it's it's sort of everyone's de facto anti-air choice that you can make because obviously a jump in is going to hit very high yeah. i did see another question came in which once again you can use hashtag ask to ask some questions of us, or now that Alex Smith has been crowned the champion, if anybody has any questions for Alex Smith specifically, you can also send those. That is, once again, hashtag AskTrigi. But we have another question. How is Leo able to reflect attacks, which we actually saw him into a play a couple of times in that Grand Finals? And I don't think Silver Fox really had to represent it very much up until this Grand Finals. So. That's true, that's true. Well, Leo does have a counter special move, mm -hmm. which, on contact with an opponent's attack, instantly forces basically like a cinematic counter and right. that does a ton of damage and it's Roman cancelable so that Leo can extend even more combo damage off of the counter all the more rewarding in the corner however if certain moves are too far away when the counter makes contact Leo won't be able to reach with his follow-up, and the players just return to a neutral state. I did not know that. I we saw that happen that. in that set as well. I, d I, I didn't even put two and two together when that happened. I have never seen... I mean, let's be real, especially when you're watching the highest level Leos, how often are they doing defensive choices? They tend to just play extremely methodical neutral and then run away with the games once the offense uh, opens up. That's very traditionally what you see yeah. uh, represented from Leo play. Honestly, Silver Fox, though, he was playing fundamentally sound. He was yeah. 6P'ing Alex just as much as Alex was starting to 6P him by yeah. then. You definitely saw, you could see the uh, the seasoned experience from the both of them. And we talked earlier on about the legacy skill and how certain fundamental skills translate over. There's a lot of what Silver Fox was doing that is maybe not the predominant way that you approach a certain situation for Guilty Gear or for Guilty Gear Striving, but is something that is learned over the span of playing fighting games for a very long time. As an example, the way that Silver Fox was walking forward to bait a throw and then neutral jumping throw attempt. That's a very old school, like Street Fighter facing yeah. style yeah, yeah. attempt 
to, we tend to refer to them as, as shimmies, which is to say when you move in in such a way to cause your opponent to believe that you're going to throw and then they tech. But before mm -hmm. you do a, th a throw, you move out of way, causing them to whiff the throw animation, yep. which you then punish. We refer to those as shimmies. And going for a neutral jump is one way to generate that. That is actually a new mechanic to Guilty Gear Strive because mm -hmm. before this game, uh, before this entry in the series rather, throws did not have a throw whiff animation unless they were a command grab. I was going to draw attention to that as well. The uh, likelihood for shimmy being rewarding is so much higher in Guilty Gear, both because there's the throw whiff animation, because throw attack is the same animation or same button as your throw uh -huh. button, and also because you're left in a counter hit state by force when you're throw whiffs. Right. So the combo that hits you next is pretty much guaranteed to be higher damage than average by a significant margin. And that's the whole appeal of like, uh, to, to bring it back to Alex Smith, who once again was able to close this out with the May. But May's fundamental game is she's got a great 2S, uh, Totsugeki to really control that space on the ground. It makes it very hard and very scary to poke against her. But once she gets into that range zero and starts running her game, it's all about frightening you about what's coming next. Uh, plus on blocks, normal move that's gonna lead into strike pressure that's gonna pump my wrist gauge or are you gonna cash out into a throw or a command grab? And it's that threat that keeps her in that spot and lets her cash out into this big damage that makes her, especially for people who aren't super familiar with fighting her, it makes it super daunting. As we talk more about the uh, the mental stack kind of idea where like all the simultaneously acting options become overwhelming and make you more hesitant and slower to react to any individual one of them, uh, you'll come to understand that fighting game th that that is essentially what makes fighting games yeah. difficult to play. Yeah. The consideration of simultaneous possibilities while still being able to react to one of them. That's the kind of question that I might want to ask Alex Smith after he's won such a tournament. I think we're going to bring him in maybe after a short break. Yeah, I was going to say all this talk of uh, balancing all these options, generating this, uh, stacking this mental stack so high it's making my head hurt. So I think we're going to cut to a quick break, but I, I believe you're right. I think when we come back, we're going to be presenting Alex Smith with the trophy uh, as the winner of Trigi, and then hopefully be able to pass on a couple of questions that some of y'all might have asked. Once again, that is hashtag Ask Trigi if you want to get them in. You just have a few quick minutes, but keep it locked here. We're going to round out the evening for you. Thanks for sticking around.
submit questions for Alex Smith, the winner of the Trigi Invitational, at hashtag AskTrigi on Twitter. Your last call to submit questions to Alex Smith.
going on, everybody? Thank you for bearing with us through that quick break. I am here with the winner of Triggy, Alex Smith. How are you? Uh, how are you feeling after uh, winning out over that? That was a close winners' final set against Silver Fox, but that uh, and grand finals too. Also, both very close. Uh, it, it feels good. I hadn't gotten to play against Silver Fox in many years, uh, with with one exception. Um, so it was it was just good to play again, and it's nice to play this game offline, especially. Uh, but yeah, it feels good. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I'm I'm personally, and, and I'm sure we can speak for uh, the whole crew here. We're all excited that you know we were able to have you and all the other players down to to do this. You said you hadn't had the chance to play against Silver Fox in many years. I know you and he both have some deep roots uh, in the FGC. Have you played against him in perhaps some older Legacy titles? Yeah, we we played Street Fighter Four way back when. Uh, that's I think that's around the time we met. So yeah. We met around a decade ago, and we've been playing uh, up until the pandemic. We, we've been playing over the years, and uh, mostly in Street Fighter. Okay, excuse me while I roll my eyes at the idea that Street Fighter 4 is both a legacy title and 10 years old. That doesn't feel okay for me. Uh, I do have some questions that were issued from the people who've been watching. Thanks, everybody, so much who has submitted questions uh, through the course of the event. I have some specifically for you. First, somebody asks, would you recommend May to a new player? Yeah, I certainly would. Uh, May to me, is a character that is, is pretty simple to get into playing, but she has a pretty high ceiling as far as uh, things that you can do. So easy to learn, difficult to master. Uh, that that type of character. Um, so yeah, I certainly would. If you if you want to play May, throw Totsukeki's and and go crazy. <laughs> she's a she's a great character for learning how to play fighting games, for learning learning how to play uh, Guilty Gear Strive. I would definitely recommend her. Awesome. Uh, so we have a, a question specifically about the Grand Finals set. Through the course of Grand Finals, how did you respond to Leo DP constant success? Did you feel conditioned to do anything differently? It's that was definitely one of the focal points of our matches in general. Um, Leo has the threat of doing his his uppercut move at almost any given time. When <laughs> Because it, it can hit you from mid-screen even if, if you're uh, poking with certain moves. Um, so it becomes a situation where you have to respect it, but then you can't get too carried away doing that because then you blow your offense. And that started to happen. I mean, uh, Silver Fox had done the uppercut move, and I'd gotten hit by it, and then I started blocking more, uh, and he would get out of my pressure as a result. So there was, yeah, there was a... A, a mind game going on there and it had to get rotated a bit you know I had to I had to start uh, attacking even despite that threat at, at points and I had to start doing uh, throw on his wake up more often to to beat the the, uh, the DP but then also uh, he can backdash if I throw and then I get in trouble so there's there's a constantly rotating uh, set of mind games there yeah. Oh, I mean, that segues nicely into, I was going to inject my own little uh, bit of extrapolation on that, but I think this leads nicely. Someone asks, uh, what is your number one tip for staying cool in situations like this one tonight? And I think that's interesting to ask now because you're talking about how varied that got and, and how you had to approach the, the mental. So, so what do you do to stay composed? I think there's, well, there really are several things that you can do. One of the best tips that I can give is to not worry about winning or losing when you're playing a match because you don't really have control over the, the win or the loss. You only have control over doing what you know how to do, making the best decisions you know how to make, uh, using the strategies you've uh, figured out in training mode, things like that. So if you really focus on your gameplay and don't worry about the result, the, you know, the, the good results will come eventually from, from the work that you put in. So. To, to not get too nervous, you just you don't really think about the win or the loss. It's it's a very difficult thing to do at first. It's it's much easier said than done. But I feel like when you you really try and put the effort in to do that, it goes a long way. Yeah, I, I mean you could see that in your play. Matt and I were were both sort of extrapolating a lot on a lot of the really smart decisions you made in the clutch. Um, and, and you're not the only player. I've I've interviewed a couple of other local players uh, that 
get wins on, on big stages like this. And they have uh, not dissimilar answers, which actually uh, leads to the next question is, uh, where is your local scene? How much do you net play? Are there any other upcoming games or events that you're interested in? We were talking a little bit about this before the camera went live. Okay. Um, a lot of the, the local scene is through Traveling Controller. Uh, the tournaments at Balance Patch in Boston on Com Ave, uh, are, those are on Fridays. I try to go to those when I, whenever I can. There's a game underground in uh, Waltham. Um, we have a few tournaments in the area. And then there are bigger tournaments like uh, Summer Jam and NEC. Uh, I'm going to CEO, it's coming up. Evo is the big one that's coming up. Uh, there, there are a lot of tournaments, both local and uh, major tournaments. And uh, re repeat, can you repeat the other part? There are three questions in there. Uh, the, the third question was about whether you net play much. Yeah, I do. Um, net play is, is pretty necessary nowadays, especially. Um, I, I find that it's really good to get on Discord and network with people, talk with different players, uh, run long sets against players that you think are, are going to give you a challenge and help you learn, um, and just, just have fun meeting people and, and enjoying a variety of players out there. So yeah, I, I try and net play pretty often. Uh, we have one final question. Uh, are we playing tonight Sincerely Monkey Business? <laughs> oh, oh, oh God, oh God, oh God. I can answer this one for you, Alex. <laughs> oh no, the commentator. Where's the camera? camera that one, camera, camera two. Yes. We are. <laughs> the directors have demanded it, and so it's happening. Oh, no. I'll be over on player two side. And Brad, you're headed back into that room as quick as possible. This set is happening oh. now. I know you want to say something in response. Here you go. And maybe Alex. Uh, do, do I still give him the trophy, or do I have to wait uh, and see? OK, well, you get this now. Hopefully, you get to go home with it. Congratulations. He's keeping, he's, he's keeping it. It's OK. We're playing for pride. OK. So playing for pride on the line, my uh, commentary buddy, FG Monkey Business, the coat is coming off. Matt is ready. For those of you who don't know, as I have to make my way back over to the both, what I will leave you with is Matt, a very accomplished player in his own right, has won the last two Buffalo Weeklies? The last two Buffalo Weeklies. You're going to see a... Uh... No, no, now you got to play. Now you got to play. Hold on, Alex, how do you feel about this? Uh... <laughs> This is gonna be interesting. I believe in the power of Totsugeki. All right, we're gonna have to see what, or what are they? They're asking what they're playing to. Uh, while they iron out the details of the set, I'm gonna make it my way back into the commentary booth to hit you guys with this surprise eleventh hour Akuma on the Thailand stage, bringing it back to the Street Fighter Two days. The secret boss, Monkey Business. We'll be right back. I'm looking at the wrong camera. We'll be right back with this surprise match. Keep it locked and loaded, y'all.
you gotta round out your own event. Are they hot? Oh god, Big Blast Sonic off the rip. Monkey Business I know picked the song. We are back with the surprise first of five. Alex Smith, winner of Triggy versus Monkey Business Invader from Buffalo, my commentary companion. I am Brad Muse on the mic. Calvin has actually come in and joined me on the mic. It is quite a time to be here. Uh, yeah, Alex Smith coming in here with a quick grab, and he's already got a lot of corner pressure against Monkey. Oh, and there's the wall splat already. Monkey, uh, Monkey was talking up a big game on the way down here today. He was very sure that whoever won, he was going to be able to put up numbers against them in the first of five after. That's why he wanted it so specifically. Not off to a great start here. Yeah, it's it's a little funny how, how much of a, a lead Alex had in that first round. Alex just has so much pressure here in the corner. Alex is using a lot of 5P. He's keeping really tight strings, I think specifically to watch for when Monkey is going to try to DP out of pressure. Big corner combo here. The Going Tyrant the Rage. There's half the life out of uh, Alex Smith already. Woo! He's ready with the extra, uh, the 5P anti-air after the attempt of the Ooh, Bandit Revolver. See. Oh, that was almost, that was like almost a punish, just a little bit too far away, unfortunately. Oh, wasn't ready for the second low. Oh, and oh you're dead. Oh, you're oh, not! You missed it. And a counter hit. Right on, I see. Oh, nope. That misses. Okay. Oh, this is so down to the wire. It connects. Had to spend the burst, did Matt. He wants to go in uh, to the I next... I want to say, mm -hmm. earlier, uh, a few days ago when I was preparing this event, Monkey Business tweeted, if you ever have to use burst on block, you would just... A coward. Oh. So the fact that he just wasted and there it is again. He's, he's using burst again. <laughs> I'm calling you out, monkey business. Oh, wow. Where's your burst? Calvin taking shots. Wake up 5K. That is actually the fastest move in the game. Saul's 5K. Three frames. He has the pro tag privilege. That is just a raw super in the corner. I have to assume that's a dropped input. Oh, no. Matt committed to the DP and it got smoked by the whale. Take this man to oh. SeaWorld. And Alex is able to, he's reading Monkey like a book. He can see what Monkey's going to do, and he, Monkey Business is not letting up. See, here's the problem. Matt's too used to this upstate New York play he's been singing. He's feeling himself playing up there in Buffalo. He doesn't know what it's like to hang out here with the fishes. There's a reason the best seafood comes from Massachusetts. Alex knows that. That's why only the freshest whales coming into this screen right now. Two games up so quick from Alex. Jockeying for position. Alex starting to get a bit of... Oh, nope. Never mind. Monkey is forcing Alex just about in the corner. Not quite there. Looking for a wall spot. Alex blocks high. Oh, smart call from Alex. The super jump into the air dash to try to steal the corner position. Matt finds the side switch, but Alex spends the burst so that he doesn't get pushed back into the corner. And we're back to mid-screen. So ready. You get none of this bandit bringer, bandit revolver nonsense. Play some honest neutral. Monkey finding his way out of the corner. Two of them trade. Triple IC getting forward. Not quite enough. Can't. Oh, there's the break. And there's the round. That is Matt's first round. Is it? He has I don't I don't believe Monkey Business has won a round so far in this set. Nice uh forward jump attempt, and Matt finds the 6P anti-air, even finds the 6H OTG for a little bit of extra damage. But Alex is critically getting a whole lot of mileage out of the uh Every en engagement that Alex is getting is really pushing the issue in terms of screen control. Oh no! Gets went for the uh, grab. Alex holds the up back out of it. All right, Matt doesn't want to spend the burst. Actually wakes up with the back throw. That's huge. Alex just got the burst back. Of course, it's going to come out on the 5K. Oh wow! Far slash connects. Oh, that was an attempt at like an IAD, an instant uh, Volcanic Viper in the air. There's a juggle root off of that that Matt didn't quite get. Oh, Matt had to spend the burst. You know he didn't yep. want to, and now he's going in to the next round here without it. Alex Smith already, oh, no. Matt f finds him, he's got him in the corner. Can't quite get the wall splat combo yet. And Alex Smith finds an opening, gets the pressure off, and never mind, uh, where do I, where do I see, correct? 
Uh, yeah, it was a red RC after the anti-air. Matt going with the fake gun flame to try to stagger pressure and get a little bit more space. He's starting to vary up the ground approach. Alex just got the burst. Oh, Matt's not going to have burst anytime soon, but the wake up 5k, that pro tag privilege of the three frames. That's that's Monkey's first round or first uh, game in the set so far. And yeah, they're, they're sticking with it. I, I assume Alex is going to stick around. I don't know Monkey that well. I assume he only plays Soul. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, I think he had said that he, he dabbles in one or two other characters. He's talked specifically about learning like Axel for problem matchups, uh, but he is predominantly a Soul player. Yeah, me, I personally am an Axel player. I can definitely say it does help being able just to poke your opponent from the fire, but once they get in, they're in. Speaking of getting in, Monkey already finds a wall splat combo. Alex Smith, though, is able to cover. Oh, and, there, and there's the first again. Oh, wow. Right at the very tip there of the anchor, Alex finds the hit. Just barely alive through that anti-air. If I'm Alex, I kind of want to, oh, cash out as much here as we can. We are going to get the super. I don't think that's going to kill on the wall break, oh. but you are going to have frame advantage situation here. But the problem is Sol has that great 6S and 6H at round start that generates so much threat. Yellow RC, able to keep himself alive. Can Alex the Ooh! Oh! The beach ball. Okay, nice jump back, blows up the Totsugeki. Matt is making a couple of different choices to try to compete with the Totsugeki on the ground. But the problem is it's not really working. He spoke so much about the importance of 6P'ing to blow up that tool, but he's having a little bit of difficulty finding that option himself here. Nice whiff punish on the throw. Alex is a little bit too far away or perhaps thought that the throw would work as a whiff punish. Oh, there's that anti-air. Monkey ma definitely making a strong comeback for himself after looking like he was going to just 3-0, get 3-0 mm. by Alex, and there's the round. And I believe that's 1-1 one, one for this set, or this game, yes. Yeah, Alex uh, Alex really believed after that PRC that uh, the late cancel back into slide was going to blow up Matt trying to steal his turn, but Matt wisely respected the uh, threat of the Roman cancel. Alex very good with that high low blocking that we saw in the early tutorial video. He clearly has practiced this a lot. A very important thing to have down, especially in an anime fighter where the aerial game is so prevalent. Oh, goes for the command grab, so smart. Command grabs are burst safe right onto the wall. That was all burst safe. Alex made the only choice of starting move to start that combo that prevented Matt from being able to burst and end the game early. Three to one here for Alex Smith already. Once again, uh, we are playing this as a first to five. I actually see that we're, uh, the studio is checking to see whether this is ready. But yeah, we're playing this out all the way to five. Matt believed that he had this down low. Down 3-1 though against Alex, not a good look, Matt. Uh-oh, that's a bad burst. And, and as you can see, I don't know how much it came up, but you see Alex after the burst, actually his burst gauge is refilling slower. If the burst does not connect at all, your burst gauge does not replenish at all once you've done it. So Alex is gonna have to wait quite a long time to get his burst back. Oh, but he's cranking out damage, looking for a wall combo, not, oh, and there it is, the full charge. Yep. Oh, I can't believe Matt went to do something there. That's normally the defensive player in that situation if there is no super. Uh, even if there is super, you tend to see a defensive blue RC to try to earn yourself some space, but Matt was greedy with his meter there. You don't get to take it with you. Monkey trying to find an opening. A lot of pressure, and he finds it. Is this corner? Yeah, this corner's got to finish, right? Oh, no, he drops the corner combo, I think. Oh, the extra overhead into the low, but none of these hits are leading to the wall splat. There is the wall splat, evening up the round count at one to one here in this game five. I wonder if Monkey did that intentionally. He didn't want the wall splat. He did not want to return to neutral when he had such an advantage in the point. Yeah, maybe, especially since he didn't have the super to use the super for the wall break. Oh, that was a early burst from Matt. Really wanted to keep this advantageous corner position, but Alex continues to be really good at threading the needle and navigating out of the corner. You get to do it on another corner now. Gold burst on wake up. Oh, monkey business, you bad man. And he's, and he's gonna, oh, not quite enough to kill off that. 
Alex holding on with just a shred for this last round in the game. Catches the backdash with a 2S. Full dash forward. The blue RC actually makes the whiffed 2H punishable. And Monkey Business closes out a second game of his own. 3 to 2. And we are mashing that rematch button. Monkey Business has something to prove. Wants to demonstrate that he is not just a commentator. And he can hang in more than just Buffalo. If Alex is going to go bursting like that, it's going to be a bad look, though. Nice back throw. Oh, no, it's a forward throw. That's going to get the corner. Oh, into the mix-up. Another back throw. Uses the PRC to side switch, but was a little bit late on the follow-up. Monkey Business spins the burst. Nice whiff punish to close out the round. You can see Alex is, I feel like Alex is either committing very much and ending up immediately on top of Matt, or ends up just out of range. I don't think that he's found that sweet spot per se. Nice Annie Air Dolphin. One of the things that uh, I think was covered in May's video, she doesn't have a lot of good Annie Air options. Dolphin yeah. is her best option. It needs to be premeditated so you can get the, the down up charge. Yeah. I mean, everyone has the 6P, but it's just, especially if you're playing May, you want to get more out of it. All oh, the yeah. 6P is really going to do is push them back into mid-screen. The Bandit Bringer immediately after the wall break situation. Real quick game from Monkey Business. And here, perhaps, we see the difference in what happens when you play first to three versus first to five. There's a whole sort of science, uh, or pseudoscience, I suppose I should say, about how matchups between players and characters can change in shorter versus longer sets. Oh, the full combo. Alex doesn't want to spend the burst because he doesn't want to be stuck in the corner. So we go post wall break situation with the burst. But the blue RC at round start blows up the slide attempt. We have plenty of damage. Alex is going to have to spend the burst. No, he wants to carry it into the next round, I think. Alex comes out. Oh, sorry, not Alex. Uh, Matt comes out the yellow RC. Able to punish Alex's Totsugek. Yeah, he's monkey business has finally found that 6P. Alex has the bar. I don't think this is going to kill him. No, it is going to wall break. But here's the problem. You have Oki, but Monkey Business has bar. Blue RC back could be a thing. No, Monkey Business hesitates on wake up a little bit. Gets nothing for it. So commonly with Sol, you either see like 6H or 6S represented straight away. Or you see like a backdrift Blue RC that you see from a lot of characters. Keeping the pressure on. Oh, but Alex tries to find something. They end up trading. Alex is back in the corner. Monkey giving him the business. Doesn't get the wall break yet. There's the wall break, and that's the round. And I believe, is that also the game? No, that is no, one round one, apiece. One. Yes. And as you all can see, Saul, uh, just as, if not even more explosive than May, he has much better corner carry and uh, has the opportunity to generate much more explosive offense. He also is equipped with a command grab and a great plus on block uh, advancing normal that makes it really hard to contest with him. But contest Alex Smith is, that's gonna be the wall break. No frame advantage off of this because it was not a super. So monkey business just holds forward. And it seems like that worked for you. <laughs> He's playing just a smidge disrespectfully. Now we get the plus frame situation. Alex still sitting on full bar. Wake up super into PRC. Is he going to be able to punish? No, because Saul has the privileged SDP. There's basically no recovering frames for that. Oh, you're dead. You're dead. Oh my god. Oh, Do the other 6H. <laughs> if you're going to style on him, finish <laughs> styling. Oh, yeah. Alex comes out with Oh, oh, doesn't got, find the anti-air. That that might even have been dead on chip. I, I don't know if it hit or if it died on chip, but Monkey Business takes the lead in the set, four to three. Monkey up in set for the first time. Gets Alex already in the corner. Monkey is, it's it must be a game of endurance. Alex has been playing all day. That's true. And he, he's got to be getting tired at this point. Monkey able to finally get him worked down and Monkey finding his own uh, his own tempo along with, of course, he's playing on PS5. I don't know if he has one of those. I know the input lag does change between console and console. Yeah, a, a little bit, but I, I don't know that it should be. I think that would matter more for, like, uh, dropping combos and stuff, which okay. did happen a little bit earlier in the set, but clearly Monkey Business is sort of acclimated a little bit. Volcanic Viper whiffs, but finds the back throw. Monkey Business in that corner pressure has to spend the YRC, does Alex Smith, bringing out that overhead threat of the 5D that he tapped. He loves to tap that as a spacing drop. 
This pressure's so bad, the empty low! Are we gonna see it again? No, there's not enough bar, but finds the anti-air and the privilege once again. No, an unfortunate drop, but the shimmy works out for monkey business, and this is set point for Matt. I can't be watching this. This is bringing back unfortunate memories of Red Bull Conquest 2018. Buffalo smoked us then. I'm not getting smoked to Triggy. Come on, Alex. I will not lie. This is gonna be a heck of a ride home for you too, if he wins this game. I won't feel bad about leaving him at the airport <laughs> if, he, if he wins out on this. We have burst on deck and a very healthy life lead here from Monkey Business. This is gonna be really difficult for Alex to overcome. Look at that wrist gauge. Alex is gonna get hit by the bandit revolver, but the blue RC, okay, not quite in range. But this is this round is almost impossible for Matt to lose. A sliver of life, Alex is yeah. on. There it goes. And New York so, has taken Triggy. So let me give you some lore. Back in 2018, there was a uh, Red Bull did a, a conquest event in Boston. They ran Guilty Gear Exert, they ran Street Fighter V, and they ran Tekken 7. Buffalo did not have their own event. And Buffalo decided to get a bus and have their whole community come to Boston's conquest event. Boston did not win a single tournament at the Boston conquest event. Buffalo won gear. I think uh, I think a different out of stater won Tekken, and I think I think a Buffalo player won Street Fighter as well. So this is giving me flashbacks that I don't appreciate. Can I was on mic for Street Fighter uh, then. Can I ask what year that was? That was 2018. I worked that event. You did. I was the TO for one of the Street Fighter Five pools. Oh my God! I didn't realize that. Yeah. I, Small I, world. But, yeah. G, uh, Great Valley Smash had been asked to help out, right. and I I was the TO at the time. I hadn't moved over to streaming yet, so. I, I was That was in that. Framingham. That was a Patriot yeah. place. Yep. Right next to the, the, the Foxborough. Uh, what is it? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Arena. not Framingham. Foxborough. Thank you. Yeah. It's a different F city. <laughs> but yeah, that I remember working that event vividly. I remember there, there was a, a player in Tekken. What's the name of the girl with the purple and pink hair? Elisa. Dressed up exactly like Elisa. Yeah. All right. I'm going to hop off. It's been great seeing you. It's been great having this production. Hey, thanks we for got putting Neo. this on, Calvin. Neo's going to pop on. We're going to have some fun. All right, what have we got now? Who's sitting down now? Does this get to be a surprise for me? All right, so first we had... Uh, hey, this is Nero. Uh, first we had Silver Fox hopping on, trying to challenge... Uh, oh, wait, I'm getting oh my, my god! Up. Monkey Business popped on. No, this cannot... <laughs> I am not willing... We have another exhibition This is up, not going to be the Monkey Business Kumite. I do not want to see this. <laughs> Somebody needs to beat him. And here's the problem, is... Monkey Business has been sitting on mic with me all night, dissecting all of your play with me. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. This is... Ugh. Okay. Let me interest Mark. I don't... Like, Matt is far too comfortable in that pose. Somebody needs to throw some ice water on him and cool him off. This ain't okay. Look, Silver Fox is playing low. He's playing the king of his country. He is asserting his dominance. <laughs> We got button checks, as got you can see. Checks. Here we go. We got two pad players here first, first of tonight. Oh, I'm trying to remember what theme this is. This, I know this is a this is a uh, a plus R like an AC theme, I think. Oh, they're just letting it rock. I guess so. I know Bunky business earlier. He, oh no, not Bunky business. He was asking for that uh, that AC. Uh, I don't, I don't remember. I think that was uh, that was Alex asking. Uh, oh, yeah. Actually, yeah. This uh, this new game, Guilty Gear Strive, I think it's got every Guilty Gear song. Uh, for the most part, yeah. There's a there's a very exhaustive uh, jukebox. Oh, the PRC. Wow, finds the five P juggle. Who needs uh, anti cross up tools? Oh, beautiful tools? gold burst there, getting that meat. Yeah, Silver Fox was using that a bunch. This this punish and coming right back, monkey business. He's just letting those DPs rock. That is soul privilege for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we saw Silver Fox get punished on landing a couple of times. You know who you won't see get punished landing on a whiffed STP? Soul, Protag privilege. He's got the three frames. He's got the fast DP. He's got all these different mobility options. A very strong character. You know the saying, plus on whiff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the oh, beautiful pressure here. Getting the wall break here. Yep, wall breaks with the 6H. What is Silver Fox going to do defensively? He goes to backdash a lot. But so monkey business 
already knew, like I said, we've been watching you guys all night, knows that Silver Fox tends okay. towards backdash if it's not a DP defensive choice. So feels secure just moving forward and taking that space. That was definitely his strategy. Trying to get the down but seeing Silver Fox seeing his on the night, he says, no, I am here. He's like, I did not come all the way here. I did not fly a connecting flight to Newark, New Jersey to not let y'all get this work. And work, he is. Worked on the mic, now working on this corner pressure on that counter hit. That should be dead. Yes, it will with the wall break damage. Another round on the board Absolute for Monkey Business. <laughs> I, what I was about to say is if this is evidence that Buffalo has a harder local than Mass, then I'm not going to feel too great. But Silver Fox doesn't go to the CT locals much, and CT isn't Mass, so I can let CT win that. It's fine. Okay, we find the counter, but smart backdash from Matt. Silver Fox already changing his tune a little bit and playing a little bit more of a mid-range game. We don't get the kill here. How hungry are we for the dub, though? Getting the perfect, though. Nice. That's the moral victory you want. Trying to keep him out with those long swords. That's all silver fox. Oh! Yeah, if Matt had been any closer, he would have thrown the counter stance. The counter is not throw invincible, only for strikes. Up back out of the bandit. But Matt is playing so aggro, there is not really any point where he is not generating some sort of threat on the screen. Blue RC is going to punish, not even a punish, just manages to buffer the DP through the success. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but look, this is looking like a game of reversal. Rock, paper, scissors. Try to see what beats what. We've seen DPs, we see 6Ps, we've got everything on the table. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right, and it's because they're both very mix-up heavy, range zero characters. I think the real difference for Saul is that Saul doesn't have the left-right aspect that Leo has, but Saul has so many different cheeky ways once you spend meter to generate different high-low mix-ups. Like that Bandit Revolver can be one or two kicks and you can PRC. What a burst bait from Monkey Business. That's the best thing about Soul. Leo, he's got his four-way mix-up on knockdown. Uh, Soul. He's got all of his plus frames, all of his cancel moves. He's always, he's threatening you on offense as much as he can. Right, and look at the range of that, representing the 6S. Just when you think you're out of range, he goes and swings that thing. He always has it on him. Oh, Meaty what a DP, Matt, come DC. on! Oh my God. All right. Matt is playing real disrespectful. He is just shy of bar. Look at that. The abandoned revolver had the bar, immediately generates that situation. Oh Hello. Wake God. up, wild throw! <laughs> so that's Soul's command grab. And you do not tend to do a command grab as a defensive oh, choice. Uh, but Matt, with the high level belligerent read. Look, Silver Fox came in. He was. He hasn't been playing this game for a couple months, but he sees everybody going. He's thirsty. He's thirsty for some matches. He thinks he's got it all. And monkey business, he says no. Sit down, son. All right, spends the burst, uh, but you're still stuck in the corner. Okay, I like the 5P mash to get around the 5D check. But Matt still has burst. When is he going to choose to pull it out? Blue RC. Matt is blue RCing when he sees Silver Fox starting to use the 6S6H oh, chains. Very beautiful DP punish there. See, this is the thing about Matt, right? Like, we, we talked about it a little bit on the mic. My hands don't do what my brain does. So I am a smart player, but I'm not a good player. Matt clearly has bridged that gap of brain to hands and is operating on the knowledge that he has dash up wild throw. He went for the second wild throw. You don't get to be that cheeky. See, that's the beautiful thing about fight fighting games. You can play chess where you've got all the time in the world to make all the strategy you want. Fighting games and you've got reaction. Fighting games is that perfect mix between strategy and execution. And we are seeing that come out with one of the business. Perfect execution. Silver Fox, he's coming up. He's... Okay, the burst from Silver Fox. I, you know what's one thing I wish we saw from Silver Fox? I don't know if he's going to be able to make it happen. Okay, wanted to try to generate some threat off the RC. Jumps out, but Monkey Business landing so quick and is already ready with that 6P. And I think that's the thing. Matt is quite literally thinking a step ahead. But the wake up 6P from Silver Fox. Now, what I was going to say, Silver Fox is trying to tap 5D and add that overhead. Because 5D is an overhead. You do have to block that standing. And he's trying to add that as an option in his mix-ups. And it's connecting... 
But if you've got bar, you can follow up off of that. You can red RC forward off of the 5D tap, and I think we need to see a little bit more of that from Silverfox if he's really going to represent this overhead threat in standing 5D. You coming in for each other with the, uh, the what's called Viper? <laughs> You're, I, I don't I don't even recall which I don't oh, remember all the names for his moves. I just know it's privilege. The five P mash. That is four games up for Matt over Silver Fox. Absolute dominance here. And you know what I'm seeing? Earlier tonight, Silver Fox was just rolling through the on rolling through the pretend. Those two taking up DP. And I'm just seeing the soul bad guy. He's just taking advantage of yeah. that. Throwing out DP after DP after DP. Yeah. And that's a very valid point. Having the ability to represent that reversal fundamentally changes the way you have to approach the risk reward. And obviously, Silver Fox is not really uh, adjusting very well to the presence of that new threat. Oh! oh really tried to call out the, the far slash with the counter, but missed it. And here comes Monkey Business again. Another DP. Are we on the verge of the cleanest of sweeps? Is Soul bad guy here? He's How about the burn it all away? <laughs> Burning Triggy down to the ground. See, he's not exactly rolling through it. He's definitely a bit close, but Silver Fox, he just can't seem to catch the ball. Okay, I like the challenge. Ooh, the cross up. I, it, looked like the, it looked like the cross-up actually might have crossed up Monkey's input, too, because he did a move that I don't imagine he wanted to do. Good counter, counter but yeah, earlier, I, he definitely could have tried to cross under and try to get the wall break. That could have given him more damage. But comes all the way to the other side, almost gets it, but Monkey business. Reversal DP, reversal DP. That's all we're seeing here. Calls it. Yeah, I love that Silver Fox backed off and tried to play that a little bit safer. Understood that he's not engaging around the DP super effectively, so he instead chooses to just sit on his life lead as best as he can. This is going to be big damage here for Matt, and you see Silver Fox is waiting. Bursts there. I wonder whether he wanted it to be a gold burst and it didn't work out, but now you're still stuck at the corner. You got away <laughs> with that DP? See, that's what I'm thinking, is that Monkey Business, he's just dominating when he comes up throw. Silver Fox needs to try to space him out more with his long swords and with his projectiles, but I, he's not going to get the chance. That's going to be it. Monkey Business, 5-0 over Silver Fox. I can't believe that y'all let him come off the mic and walk in that room and give himself this gas. You know how expensive gas is right now? Y'all just handed Monkey Business this much gas. And thank you, Lord Daigo, with the will to keep on winning. He's got that book right there. He just downloaded it, ran right through everybody. Uh, I, if if y'all could see me rolling my <laughs> eyes right now. But so there you are. Uh, if you play Guilty Gear, if anything about today has inspired you to try out this game, a screen that you'll see plenty of, the Saul wind screen, a very dominant character in this title. And, and like I said uh, before we came in here, Matt is no slouch, uh, a very established uh, commentator, but also still actually competes, uh, has won the last two of the Buffalo Ranbat uh, local events now that they have come back. So definitely has been playing this game for quite a while. Oh, for sure. And any of you viewers, if you want to get into Guilty Gear, if you like what you see tonight, this game is available on PC. It's mm -hmm. on PlayStation. You got either of those? You're yep. good to go. I see this game on sale a lot. Perfect opportunity yep. to jump in whenever yep. you want. And crossplay is coming soon, so everything uh, will be unified uh, coming sometime in Season 2, which is coming later on this year. But that has been Triggy. Uh, the full bracket, as well as two surprise first to fives and one very gassed up co-commentator. I have been Brad Muse. Thanks, everybody, so much for having me on here. Nero, thanks for hopping in for this final exhibition set. I'm not letting Matt in here to say bye. We're just going to sign off right now. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. You do not get to say anything to the people at home, Matt. <laughs> we love you all. Be safe. Take care. Have bye. Have a good night.